Sacred Symbols, a PlayStation podcast, is brought to you by, well, you. If you want to learn how to support our show, go to patreon.com slash laststandmedia. Greetings and salutations. Welcome back to Sacred Symbols Plus, a PlayStation podcast supplement. My name is Colin Moriarty. I'm joined by a very interesting group of people today. Now, I want to just before I even get into who's here, you can see if you're watching, you already fucking have your eyeballs and look on the screen. You can see who's here. But um, this was supposed to be a knockback episode. And I was playing Final Fantasy VII Remake again. I played it back in 2020, but Dagan was playing for the first time. People might know that it's really rough in the animation industry right now. Dagan's an animator. So he was unemployed for a little while, just doing some freelance on the side. He got a job and he no longer has time to finish the game. I literally, literally took, and I wrote it down, 3,900 words of notes during my playthrough. It's 10 pages typed. And I was like, it would be, and I was maybe, when Dagan told me this, I was maybe on chapter 14 or whatever. And I was like, are you fucking kidding me? You know, because I had, I had prepared all of this. So I was like, we have to pivot because I can't waste all of this time and all of this effort in doing this. So here's the thing. I gathered a group of three people in our orbit, in the LSM orbit that I think can speak to this game very well. People might recall, I think it was episode 75 or so of Sacred Symbols Plus. Dustin and I, it was when the show was audio only. So that's how old it was. It was from 2020. Um, we did a we did a hour and 45 minute spoiler cast or whatever. I listened to it today. I almost never do that. I put it on two times speed and I skipped everything Dustin said. <laughs> but, I wanted, but, I wa- but I wanted to. But I wanted to hear what I said about the, the game. And then I that's what's on these pink notes. Um, like the, 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 the different points I made at that time, because I'm like, what did I say about it then? And how do I feel it now? And so I'll be able to compare and contrast that. But instead of having Dagan on the show, since there's no longer time and since, instead of that being a knockback, we thought we would do just a second episode of Sacred Symbols Plus to take that uh, episode's place. And we have this group of people here, this fine group of people here that can help us get through it. So let's get through everyone that's joining us today. I don't think we've ever had this specific combination actually on any of the shows. So that's unusual and kind of cool. Mm-hmm. I think that's true. Brad Ellis. Yo, Brad. Good to see you. You're back in California. We're recording this after the live show in New York City. I must say, you were very impressive during the live oh, show, in my, in my opinion. You. Um, you really put it on. You know what you're doing. And uh, it just reaffirmed how I felt about you and what I knew about you already as a creator. So thank you for your hard work at the show. It was excellent. Good to have you back in California, though. Safe and sound. Yeah. In your little you. egg, in your little Orange County bubble. Yes, thank you. I appreciate and now, those fan words. Yes. How are you today, my friend? Good to see you. I'm good, man. I'm feeling real good today. Yeah. So I'm happy to be here. Why are you feeling so good? I don't know. I'm just well rested, I think. Oh. Got some good sleep. Nice. Got Unlike some, Dustin. Dustin doesn't get good yes. sleep. Yes. <laughs> no, he does not. No, no, no. <laughs> That's Gene Park laughing on uh on his mic from the Washington Post. Good to see you, my friend. How are you today? Good. I, 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 I love your attempts to, to, to reignite Sleepgate. Yeah, I really am trying to get it going. Yeah, again. you're really trying, but, but yeah. Dustin isn't having any. No, of he it. isn't. Um, there was a comment on the last podcast that, that said Colin is trying like really hard to get. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, fucking, <laughs> <laughs> we we noticed like it and, and I, think, I think we appreciate it. Um, oh, I want to echo your statements about Brad. Uh, I was actually literally just thinking that like yesterday. I was just thinking about Brad, but like, it was just, like, I was just so impressed by, by how easily he just felt natural with our group you know and mm-hmm. you know like, i'm fairly new with the group too but i just felt like brad has always been with us the whole time you know yeah ex- that's exactly right it yeah. felt very normal um yeah it felt extremely normal which was yeah. weird because it's like yeah. this is the first time i'm meeting this guy this is the first time any of us are meeting this guy like <laughs> the, the the fact that we had that much chemistry in person like immediately it's impressive so yeah yeah, yeah. you did you all did and you did very well too we had a very emotional yeah. moment i'm Hell really yeah. looking forward to Seeing the video that will be available on Patreon soon. Yeah. Um, I don't know how soon. Dust, you know, big news. I mean, do we even spoil the news about Dustin or do we just let that kind of. Oh, he, he put it on Twitter. Oh, yeah, he, he put it on Twitter. Out, okay, great. So, great, great. Okay. Oh, that's right. Okay. So I yeah, never look at his Twitter either. So, <laughs> right. Yeah. No, I, I just, I would delete his Twitter account if I could. <laughs> it was funny to hear Dustin on the show because it was before he was like a member of any of the podcast, really. So he was a little more reserved. Um, oh, I should listen to that. I, yeah. I, I, I've actually watched Dustin's old work um, in, in, in w- when he tried to do other shows, and it's pretty good stuff, too, actually. Yeah, you know? yeah he's mm-hmm. good. Yeah, yeah, he's very good. 
I can see it why was very lucky for us to. It's very lucky for me to find him. I mean, it's very lucky for him to find me, I guess, too, in some sense. I don't want to say it's not, but uh, like I definitely need Dustin. You know, like to, or yeah. when he has to go away, we were talking about it because he's I'm going to give him a few months off probably when he ha- when he has his kid. And it's like. We got to I don't know what we're going to do. What are we going mean, to do? What the we're hell? I probably have to. I mean, it, well, honestly, it's probably going to be a lot more that we're going to have to. Right. That's going to have to take control, um, which is totally fine. I don't like having a European in charge, but if that's the way it's got to be, we'll allow that to happen. Rick Hogue, <laughs> our third and final guest today. Good to see you, my friend. I loved your video at the show. I appreciated it. You were indeed the first paid contributor to the podcast that like wasn't a regular roving host. And um, I'm glad that like you, I get mad when I see that people don't do that on podcasts of note. You know what I mean? It's like you're a lawyer. So your time is worth a certain amount when we're at. It's like, hey, uh, Rick, can you come fucking break this shit down for me? You can do it for free. It's mm-hmm. like a little it's a little mm-hmm. much, you know, in my opinion. Rick, welcome to the show. <laughs> Oh, I'm happy to be here. Any day you can talk about Final Fantasy is an okay day for this lawyer. Uh, but yeah, I'm glad the video worked out. Speaking of Lockmort, he was the one that put that together and asked me, and I know a number of other people, to put together stories about our time at Last Stand Media. Uh, and he did show me the the final cut there, which I thought was very funny, as his cuts often are. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so I hope that you had a great show. Thank you. Yeah, and we... Now for the next two shows, if they go along as planned, we're going to have to divide and conquer. And I have a vision for you at our next show that I want to talk to Ben next week um, about what role you would play there. But I think it would be a very good role for you. Um, so we're going to have you in the flesh of one of these shows soon, too. Which I'm I mean, our, 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 our show is very judiciary. Yeah. <laughs> anyways, right. Uh, right. Ju- ju- judiciarily. Whatever. Judici- so. Judiciarily. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah uh, i'm sorry you couldn't be there but we're gonna have you at the next one if if your schedule your schedule allows it i'm sorry i do uh, like schedule that's, that's i like a, i like sensation yeah i like this i like saying and leisure as well <laughs> you know what always bugs me though is whenever i hear people say what and then they pronounce the the h they sort of go what what like hey, why? or something well, why is that <laughs> that's like um stewie on the family guy oh yeah a little, bit. Why? a little bit yeah. Quit clean. Yeah. But it's definitely old people, definitely old white people oh, that say yeah. that the most. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's interesting. By the way, don't be jealous, uh, Brad, but someone at the show, I, I forgot to even, ch- well, I actually didn't know because he gave me a bag and I didn't go through it till later. He gave Magnet Man's my favorite Mega Man bag Ooh. guy. And he gave, like, I don't know what these are from, but I don't know what those are either. Gosh, of yeah. course. Um, yeah, it's like, it says it's, what is it? Is there a, Oh, Universal Fighting System. Hmm. You know what that is? No. Mm. I've never heard of that either. But they're really cool art. Don't be too yeah. jealous. All right. Brad, are you what? a Mega Man fan too? Yeah, I love Mega Man. Not as much as Colin, but I do like Mega Man. Yeah, same here. By the way, level five shirt. Oh, when they used to be the goats. <laughs> Dark Cloud. Dark Damn, Cloud. Man. Dragon Quest Jeez. Eight. Dragon Quest Eight, that's right. And of Rogue course, Nino Kuni. Yeah, Nino Kuni. And Professor Layton. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Enough about that. Enough about all of that. It's time to talk about <laughs> other Japanese games, specifically a Japanese game called Final Fantasy VII Remake from 2020, re-released on PS5 in 2021 with the Yuffie DLC. Now, I went through and played the PS5 version. I had played the PS4 version in the past. I accept that I'll never get that platinum trophy, so I just moved on and redid it again. And maybe I'll, I, I kind of think I will because there's a new game plus functionality. There's the harder difficulty and all the things. I didn't do everything in the game. Um, I did all the side quests, but not like the optional bosses. I'm not even sure how you f- do some of the trophies, like fight a Marlboro oh. or whatever. I'm like, I have no idea how you even do that, but um, maybe one day I'll get back to it. But I played it on PS5, 60 frames, beautiful, looks great. Am I crazy or are the cutscenes in 30 frames still? They like probably the, are. Yeah, which makes sense, yeah. I guess. Because I did yeah. notice Yuffie's was much smoother than the mm-hmm. ending of the actual game, but it was beautiful and I was happy to play through it. I got deeply distracted by Helldivers during it so it took me a lot longer than i wanted to to get through but it was fun to play i played for about 31 hours i think 32 hours so not too bad i want to go around now it's important especially you spoiling gene let's try to keep the final fantasy 7 what is it rebirth rebirth Rebirth. spoilers out of this if we can i know it's very difficult to talk about the past while having knowledge of the present but -hmm. if we can divorce that even just for my sake because i have not played rebirth yet 
um, and analyze it through this lens because I'm sure you all have new views and viewpoints and we'll get into that in future episodes, of course, and probably have. I actually think that's a pretty good meta commentary for some of the stuff that's happening in Remake. So yeah, oh, exactly. it is difficult. Um, <clears throat> interesting. I appreciate that. Well, I wanted to go around and kind of just get everyone's thoughts. I mean, we're divorced from the game by almost four years now from when it came mm-hmm. out. I mean, I think it came out April of 2020, if I remember, right at the beginning of COVID, actually. So it's a very interesting game. And I played it at that time, but then I was moving into my house at that time. So I just never got around to finishing it. And then mm-hmm. that fall, I went back and played it again. So that's how I got through it the first time. Mm-hmm. But uh, Gene, let's start with you. I mean, what now that we're years removed, and again, it was interesting listening to that podcast, and everyone's had time to marinate the the fan theories had run amok. I think we have a better understanding. I certainly have a better understanding of the game now than I did then about like the the alternate timelines and all of the rest that were not quite clear. So what what are your thoughts on Final Fantasy VII Remake now that we're four years out, and how do you look back at it? Yeah, I look at look back. Well, so uh, to be clear, I actually played this game right after Rebirth. So uh, my memory of Remake is very fresh. And <clears throat> that re- I played it on the Steam Deck. Um, and Chris has been playing on the Steam Deck, too. And he's been really enjoying it. It's a re- it, And I echo what he said. It's a really good Steam Deck game. It's very cozy. You know, the music and everything and then the characters. And it just like you just curled up in bed. And then you're just doing all these. It's it's a very very simple and linear game. And back then, when I played it in 2020, I didn't really like it. Even though I do acknowledge that obviously, you know, that part of FF7 in the original game was also very very linear too. Um, so I didn't really knock it for that. But I did wish that it was a little bit more experimental. And then now, you know, we do get that later <laughs> in other games. But I have learned to appreciate remake for what it is. Um, it is a, like pretty much a cool Final Fantasy VII, like a beat 'em up version of the intro of Final Fantasy VII. You know, um, you're just going down these hallways and slashing at enemies. Um, the combat still holds up to me. Um, the story is still really, really good. It's still really, really fascinating. I still, you know, I just watched the intro cutscene again last night. I could watch that cut- intro cutscene over and over again all whole day. It doesn't matter. It's like listening to Stairway to Heaven, you know, basically. Um, and that's what Final Fantasy VII is, you know. It's interesting that, you know, I always think about playing the OG, you know, and 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 it's hard to to describe to people what it was like to play the original Final Fantasy VII in 1997 when 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 other games looked like everything else, you know. And then the cutscene came out. I I I I compare it to it must be what it must have been like seeing Star Wars in theaters for the first time, you know, in the 70s, because we don't we don't know any of that mm-hmm. that experience at all, you know. From just watching a regular ass movie and then watching Star Wars immediately, you know, and we all we all know we hate Star Wars, but Star Wars is a groundbreaking film. <laughs> so Final Fantasy VII is kind of that too, and remake conjures a lot of that emotions, and it, that's what remake does so well. That's what this remake trilogy does so well is that it really, really taps into our emotions of how we felt in in the game and how the the story actually is too. Um, and we can get more into that later. But yeah, I just really appreciate it. It's a great action game. It's just a lot of fun. I the replaying it again. I had more fun replaying it again in 2024 than I did even in 2020. And I loved it in 2020. So yeah, I think this is a great game. I, I, I love it even more now since the, the, the now that more time has passed. Yeah, it's, it's interesting to think that because I, I kind of feel the same. I wonder if it's because I just have a better context for everything now. Like, I, like mm-hmm. anything, like seeing a film for the second or third time, you just start to be able to pay attention to the creases and mm-hmm. and all of that and see more so and not be so confused and mystified because i was very strict I, I, i'm i'm very strict with games i actually care about which are not very many like that i actually care about where i'm like i don't want to read anything or know anything or even mm-hmm. know what other people are saying about it but that kind of comes with its own ignorance where i'm like i'm not really sure if i understand this fully and now the second time through mm-hmm. i get it a lot better so mm-hmm. Um, Hogue, let's even, go to you. Where do you begin? Well, to real quick, oh, also, even, even yeah. story wise, uh, you're, you're talking about story wise, but even gameplay wise, uh, there was some. When I played the game in 2020, I thought there was so many, so much padding and everything. And there still is padding, right? And we can talk more about that. But when I played it last month, I was like, you know what? The padding is not actually that bad. You know, the, the parts that I thought that were, that were so friction heavy, I got through them pretty quickly. So it's like, you know what? That's not that bad. This game is so fun to replay. I love it. Anyway, sorry. No, Somebody's no, got to find those cats. Those yeah, cats yeah, are not yeah, going to yeah. find well, themselves. I just skipped the fucking cat quest. That's it. You know? Yeah. <laughs> you can skip a, You can skip a lot of that stuff. It's like my OCD will not let me skip anything like that. You know, yeah. um, it was like playing in the DLC. I didn't even know that there was like a four Condor mini game. And I'm like, oh, God, now I got to get sucked into this fucking God, goddamn bullshit. But I did. I did get <laughs> some. You love Fort Condor. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Fort Condor is excellent. Um, 
Hogue, what are you, what are your kind of high level thoughts here on Final Fantasy VII Remake as we have? Um, sure. Our well, for here? to start off with, for people that don't know, Final Fantasy is probably my favorite series in video games. Like some of my favorite experiences as a younger gamer were Final Fantasy two and three here in America, or four and six. If you're playing the pixel remasters or know the series better internationally. And after Final Fantasy VI slash three for me, I was so excited about the future of the series that I pre-ordered Final Fantasy VII whenever like the first GamePro or EGM articles were made about it being full motion video and pre-rendered backgrounds and all these things that were just mystifying to me as a young person. And I had that pre-order in my wallet for like two years waiting for September 1997. Remember that when you had to have the receipt? Yeah, yeah, I had, I had it in, oh in carbon. God, I had the carbon. I had the receipt. I had everything. Uh, and I was at a shit, wedding dude. that summer and was thrown into a pool. And then I can still remember trying to blow dry this receipt in case somebody couldn't read it because it was a long time ago, folks. Yeah, it, it really was. So, Gene, I'm fu- it's funny that you that scratches something in you, too. I remember that so well. Like, it's like, OK, give me the you have to have the receipt. You know, it's like I remember I used to have like my, my wallet was Full of receipts, you know, but because I used to pre-order so much. I'm like, mm-hmm. this, this is like, I used to think the re- the receipts were more important than the fucking money that I had in the wallet, you know, which was I used to pre-order worse. everything, too. I have no idea why. In fact, I remember going to EB. And so I guess it was 2002 ish or whatever when they re- they didn't it wasn't remastered. They just re-released Resident Evil 2 and Resident Evil 3 on GameCube. I don't know if you guys remember yeah, that. So they did they a remake. Did. And then and I went and pre-ordered those. And the guy, I remember the guy being like, why are you pre-ordering these? Mm-hmm. Like even at the thing, and I'm like, I don't know. I just pre-order everything. <laughs> You know, <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it's it was still the, the time of physical media, so like you could still like sell out of a game, and then like when when the game sold out, you're fucked, right? What do you especially buy it in a digital store? You know, you can't do that shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You had to drive oh, around, so you go to a friend's house, and, and and play his copy because because he bought it first. Yeah. <laughs> so. Oh, anyway, I yeah. cut in. Go ahead and continue. Oh no, not at all. Uh, so I love Final Fantasy, and Final Fantasy VII was a big moment in my gaming life, the original time in 1997, and then. Throughout all of that, you had like the PlayStation, was it the PlayStation 2 or the PlayStation 3 that was like using Final Fantasy VII's intro to show the tech uh, and what it could do. And so there was always kind of whispers and mumblings of potentially having a remake with modern graphics, whatever modern meant at the time. So when the remake project was finally announced, you know, the promise has been made, I was so excited about all of this stuff. And then I wasn't really excited about the project itself when I played Final Fantasy 15 and some of the other Square Enix games because I didn't really trust modern Square Enix to get it done right until they had some kind of uh, like hour long or 90 minute presentation where I remember they explained what the battle system was going to be and what they were going to do with this. And I thought for myself for the first time, oh, this is going to work. And so I was really excited about the Final Fantasy 7 remake project even going in, maybe not to the level of 1997, but close to it. I had played the, the bombing demo a number of times before it came out. And then as I do, when I get a new final fantasy, I let the crystal theme play on the, on the main menu as I started off and a bit, right. (laughs) You know, you get that, you get a little bit of emotion in the the, the tear ducts, a little dusty. Uh, But in all honesty, the the very first thing I want to talk about is that music, right? So this is Uematsu at the top of his game, either six or seven is really one of my favorite scores of Final Fantasy, and you get all of that. Which one do you like better, a, six or seven? I think probably six. I think mm-hmm. six has some of the more direct operatic stuff in it. I still remember the credits and and Terra's theme and that kind of thing. But I love I love the the Velt song. Doom, da doom, da doom, da doom. Oh yeah, it's like mm-hmm. it's just a sick, like totally different than everything else on that on that uh that soundtrack. It's anyway. it's, it's kind of like the precursor to the Cosmo Canyon theme, which is also mm. like awesome, right? So Yeah. Well, and all of this stuff with the kind of <laughs> so, sorry, I am clearly thinking about Reaper at this point, so. It's all right. I think people Cosmo Canyon is in the Final Fantasy 7 remake, remake project series of games. So mm. I, I don't think that's a big spoiler. Uh but yeah, I love the music in this. I love what it looks like. I am amazed every time I turn remake on. Right when you see the train and you see the new highly polygonal cloud uh, with his hair perfect jumping off the train and everything that kind of you thought you saw back in 1997 brought to life in modern graphics is just so amazing to me, and that that probably puts me at a higher tilt level than some folks, especially that don't have that connection with the older game. But I adore remake, and I think the battle system in remake. I'm a little bit different from Gene. I don't view it as a beat 'em up. I I don't view it as an action game really. I view it as the perfect hybridization of the turn-based active time battles 
and allowing you to essentially hit square to swing the sword. That's true uh, too. And so yeah. I, I think it's the best battle system Square Enix has ever come up with. I, I wish they could have in, used it for Final Fantasy 16, in all honesty. Uh, <laughs> but I think that Remake shows that you can make a party-based RPG with a good technical, strategic kind of point of view and still make it accessible for a modern audience. And I think it's the, it's the path forward for Square. And, and I love it to death. Yeah, it, I will say, you'll, it, by the way, it's funny, just to, I was looking at the patch notes for Final Fantasy 16. They're taking weird things out of Final Fantasy 7 and putting it in a 16, like um, the go right to the quest giver when you're done with the quest. Mm-hmm. That's going to be in the new patch and all that. So they're, they're borrowing some of it around the edges, which is cool. I am with you in the sense that Square Enix never truly fell off, in my opinion. Like uh, Capcom kind of fell off completely for a minute. Um, some other Japanese publishers. I think Square Enix kind of held on with like there wasn't a year that went by really over where I wouldn't play a Square Enix game in like one of them. But there were there were weaker times. Final Fantasy 13, I think Final Fantasy 15, this era, pretty weak. And I had no hope in Final Fantasy 7 remake. I remember even before we found out CyberConnect was making it at the, uh, the original version, I was like, this is a huge mistake. People have to remember And this is like a piece of lost history for some reason that a lot of people don't think about. Square Soft, before the Square Enix merger, announced a remake of Final Fantasy VII for PlayStation 2 Mm -hmm. and then never said another word about it. And in fact, I think they said it. they announced 7, 8, and 9 would all be remade for PS2. And so they had always been kind of thinking about it and banging it around in their heads. And that was obviously a good idea not to do that. It would have been totally stupid at the time. But I was like... Namora was involved in it, which I was like, uh, you know, no, yep. it's just like, I don't, I like the Dragon Quest sensibilities of Square Enix, not the, not the modern or what were the modern Final Fantasy sensibilities of Square Enix. And so I was just nervous about this game from every angle. And one of the things I wrote down in my pink notes here, on my pink paper, the, the things I said in the old show and what I wanted to reiterate here is like how thoroughly wrong I was about Final yeah. Fantasy VII. Like, I don't think you were wrong, or at least I don't think anybody that was at least cautious about this project was wrong, because I do think, uh, you say Nomura, I tend to call the modern Square Enix sensibility that I don't love so much Kingdom Hearts, and that gets me in trouble in certain quarters on the, on the internet. Uh, but that's what I was worried about the Final Fantasy VII project being, and even during all the CyberConnect stuff and then pulling it back in-house, I was like, well, they're doing whatever they're doing. I'm not, I might not see it for 20 years. You know, this was just off of Final Fantasy XV, so I'm not going to think about it. And it really didn't start to be something I was excited about until that that one presentation that I can't even remember what the context was, but it was long and it was like at a dinner theater. You all might have been there or, or know better than me, uh, but that was where I changed my mind on it and I didn't get excited until then. It was like two months before its release date. And so I don't blame anybody for looking at Square Enix and saying, we don't know what you're going to deliver on Project X or Y. Uh, I'm now excited about the Remake Project after that presentation, playing Remake, playing Rebirth, Whatever the last re is going to be, uh, I, I think the project overall is in good hands, but I don't blame anybody for not being sure of that going into it. Yeah, I, I must admit, and throwing it over to you, Brad, I mean, I must admit that I didn't believe it until I played it. Even mm-hmm. when people even when people went and previewed it and talked about it, and then the, the medic score came out and all that, I'm like, I just don't believe you. Like, I just, <laughs> the, the game is, how could it be? Like, how mm-hmm. could you take something like this? Because... I think Final Fantasy VII is is special in a lot of ways to all of us um, because I've said the story so many times I won't get into it, but just I sold much of my game collection to buy a PS1 and pre-order Final Fantasy VII. Like it was, I still have, you can't really see it. Where is it? Yeah, it's like back on the second shelf, like kind of where my finger is. That is a Final Fantasy VII cardboard stand from GameStop in my mall that they, and my phone numbers on the back of it and they gave it to me when it was over like I used to have the po- there's a picture of me playing my PS1 in 1998 or 1999 in my bedroom and my Final Fantasy 7 poster from the stores on my door like I was completely obsessed with it but then I had this this kind of trail with Final Fantasy 7 where I began I began to resent how it started to bring people into the genre and kind of dilute it from my perspective, which was such a, mm. I was a high schooler, so it was very delusional. And then I kind of held on to that for a while. So I think it was kind of tainted by that too, but it was still something very special where I was like, I don't know how you can do it justice like this. And yet they did, they did it so much justice. I mean, they like they did it, not only did they do it justice, but they tricked everyone. 
They did. And, and in some way, there's like a meta game. There's like a meta story in how like the game itself won't allow itself to be remade. Mm-hmm. You know, like that, that it's too iconic. There's like some through line. So anyway, Brad, what are your kind of 40,000 foot thoughts on Final Fantasy VII Remake? Um, yeah, so I think Final Fantasy VII Remake is kind of a miracle that it came out as good as it did. Like you guys are saying, of course, I was excited. You know, Final Fantasy VII is one of my favorite games, if not my favorite game. So when the remake got announced, I was very excited. Cyber Connect 2 did worry me. When For I people heard who don't that, know, it, uh, Brad was on the iconic Easy Allies uh, reaction to that. That, that was game trailers. Oh, well, oh game, game trailers. trailers. I'm sorry. Game trailers. Yeah, that's right. Way yeah. back in the day. Way back then. Holy crap. Yeah. Anyways, sorry. But uh, yeah, Cyber Connect 2 worried me on that because I was like, oh boy, it's not made in-house. But once I found out a lot of the staff who were on the original game were involved in it, like uh, Katase, Nojima, Nomura. I know you guys all roll your eyes at Nomura, but to me, Nomura is a spirit of a lot of old Final Fantasy and Sakaguchi definitely respected that about Nomura. He's the one that told Nomura to make Kingdom Hearts like Final Fantasy in that storyline. So you can thank Sakaguchi for a lot of that. But um. Obviously, when they showed the gameplay, I was very happy with it. I was always open to the idea. I know a lot of people were upset that it wasn't going to be turn based right away. People are like purists, I would say, just be mm. upset about it. I was I'm always very open to Square Enix or I guess developers just doing what they want to do right away or doing what they want to do for their game. So when I finally saw it in action, it was action combat. And I was like, OK, I'm fine with this. This is cool to me because it made sense to me because like they were making it more avid children. And that makes total sense to me that they had followed in those footsteps. But once we found out more about it and how well they're incorporating elements from the original game, particularly the ATB system, like Hogue was saying earlier, I think that was like the perfect idea and the perfect marriage of these two iconic turn-based ATB gauge systems and modern action combat. And it worked out so goddamn well. I was very pleased with it. But yeah, I and and like when we heard about the story, wouldn't be the same in a lot of ways. We knew about that some of the, when we we're before the game was came came out, and I was okay with that. <laughs> I remember I reviewed the game for Easy Allies at the time, and I was playing through the game, and I was like, I love this, but this is gonna piss a lot of people off. So I was very curious to see what people thought of it when it came out. But it seems like it's mostly positive nowadays. I would say. I remember when it came out, people were very upset. A lot of people were, but I was always down with it. And like we were saying, I think it was a miracle that this game turned out as good as it did. It felt like a real turnaround for Square Enix as a company in general. Yeah, I agree. Because we we thought, you know, we were talking about 13. I don't I don't like Final Fantasy 13 at all. Me neither. I, think I mean, I, like the, I actually like the combat system is probably the only thing about it. I like I think that is the only is good thing about that game. Yeah. The only good thing. Sorry, yeah. I know some people like 13, but I don't think it's very well, good. I, 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 it's, it was like such a... It, the thing about 13, I just felt like it was adding insult to injury, and I really mean this, where they were like, we're going to just make another Final Fantasy 13, and then we're going to make a third Final Fantasy 13. It's like, <laughs> right. are you guys kidding? Yeah, that was weird. <laughs> like, you're, are, like, are you so tone deaf? Like, what is this? I don't understand what don't you're know. doing. Like, I, I, I don't know. And I was really in the media at the time, and I'm like, I don't think anyone's... At, especially when 13.3 came out, I'm like, I don't think... Lightning right. returns. I which was good. Was asking for this. Yeah, yeah. the yeah. sequels are yeah. actually better than the original game. In fifteen, I was mixed on. Or I liked fifteen at the time, but I'm kind of mixed on now. But I haven't played the updated versions of it. I couldn't get through the first few lot. hours. I just couldn't. I, fifteen was just like I can't do that. I don't know. Uh, there was something about it where I was like, "There's so sure." I get it. It's um, different. I, I, yeah, I think it is different. Is better but than the different but part. But I do think fifteen is a game where you look at it, and I enjoy myself every time I play it. But the aspects of it that you were playing, you can recognize as being a little half-baked while you're doing it. I just think mm-hmm. it works together better than you might think, just looking mm-hmm. at all the in- ingredients separately. Yeah. Just really bad quest structure in 15. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, especially cats. in the beginning. The, the, the royal edition like actually like fills it with a lot of meat, and it's like it's, it actually feels like a real complete That's game. what I hear, yeah. So yeah. I need to play that. Oh, you day. never played royal edition? Oh, you no, should play I it. only played the base version, yeah. Oh, the, 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 the additional – they added like a lot of story yeah. into it. Uh, I it, think – I think you should, should go back to it. I know. I uh, want to. If you liked it, you should go back to it. It's going to be an almost completely different experience at this point now. Gene, I think some of my baggage with 15 is because Versus 13 turned into that. And I was very yes. excited for Versus 13. Versus 13 looked way more appealing to me. Me too. And me still too. does, honestly. To yes, what I would rather play 15. Versus 13 right now. Yes. Yeah. So 
That yeah. always kind of hung in the shadows. <laughs> I was playing that game, but I feel like Versus Thirteen became Seven Remake, kind of. Right? Yes, kind of that, that, that yeah, attitude yeah. or whatever, and that gameplay or whatever, right? Yes, yeah. Um, yeah. There is a little bit of Versus Thirteen at the very, very end of Fifteen in, in the Royal Edition. Yeah. It's there. It's I've, there. Uh, yeah, there's some. Of, there's like really, brief really flashes, but yeah. yeah. But anyway, sorry. Versus Thirteen in Kingdom Hearts. It's yes, all over. There is. There is. <laughs> Uh, and to be clear, yes. I, I, I used to hate FF13. I hated FF13 with a passion, a burning passion. And I played it a couple years ago, and I was like, I actually kind of like it. It's all right. There are those old, yeah. pe- people dug up the old IGN guides videos I did for Final Fantasy 13 where I sound so mad that I'm even having to play it. <laughs> I, yeah, I that's watched so funny. You sound like you wanted to fucking kill yourself. Dude. <laughs> that's so funny they made you do that. <laughs> like, I never have never heard anyone more miserable than that before because you're explaining everything and you're explaining everything very well but it's like a <laughs> practical joke they played on you making you do that they made me edit those videos too but yeah is, go check out those videos it's, it's a good time yeah right, you'll appreciate though that final fantasy 7 made mm-hmm. me and i was like okay nomura i guess i've been a little hard on you like mm-hmm. it's hard to be too it's amazing that all of these ogs at square soft mm-hmm they were jumping around from like front mission to chrono trigger to fucking what it's like Parasite they had their hands on yeah parasite yeah. like they had their hands on everything and it's mm-hmm. hard to be like oh you don't know what the fuck brave fencer musashi it's mm-hmm. like oh you guys don't know what the fuck you're doing you know right and really i i always thought i was like no at some point namora didn't really well he clearly did know what he was doing because kingdom march is huge but from for mm-hmm. me i'm like he rose to a position outside mm-hmm. of being like an artist mm-hmm. where mm-hmm. i was like he doesn't really belong there uh, sure. in my opinion I think a lot of people shared that feeling. But I don't feel that way anymore. Like this, I mean, I I can't. Final Fantasy VII Remake is is revelatory in in some sense where it's like, yeah, yeah. you said it, it needed an old soul and some sort of like some sort of connective tissue to the past to kind of keep it grounded and show respect. That's why I think that there's like a one thing I picked up in my playthrough this time is like there is a. And I don't think it's intentional. It's like how people overanalyze books and movies. So like, forgive me, but I, I gleam some sort of meta narrative about the remake of the game. Mm -hmm. You know, there's there's absolutely a meta narrative. You can absolutely say the whispers of fate are the fans asking for everything to stay the same. Right. Right? Like that plays out throughout the entirety of remake. Mm -hmm. And while I don't love the whispers, I don't love some of the stuff they did there. I don't love the ending of final fantasy seven remake. That's where I really, get the most kind of upset and it's the part that's the most separate from the final fantasy seven original experience. I can understand why creative people would feel some of those feelings about being tied to what they did 25, 30 years ago and not wanting to go down exactly the same path and potentially open things up for themselves. But the lawyer in me, the guy that loves final fantasy seven is still a little bit frustrated that they called this project final fantasy seven remake because Even being generous, it's a sequel or side sequel, alternate lost galaxy sequel. Yeah, it's like a string theory sequel of Final Mm -hmm. Fantasy VII. Yeah. Yeah. Have you guys Um, watched Evangelion Rebuild? No, no, I've not. You haven't either, Brad. That's what I know. I've heard about these these comparisons. There was like a fatherly disappointment. In your voice, Gene. <laughs> I've seen the yeah, original yeah. Avon. Yeah, I, I, I even, I even said his name, Brad. You, yeah. you, you, you haven't either, Brad. I know. Mm. No, Bradley. I haven't seen yeah. that. Yeah. Interesting. <laughs> um, the, the, this project is absolutely influenced by that. If you yeah. know anything about what, what the rebuild series of movies does to the original Evangelion, it is the exact same thing, basically. Mm-hmm. And yeah. remake, it, rebuild. It's why I love our Brad when we had our conversation and I clipped it out and it got circulated about me going crazy about final fantasy seven and oh we're, we're no who was i talking to i guess it was you brad where i was saying like final fantasy i was screaming like final fantasy seven remake is not a right. remake mm-hmm. and oh, it was me. I, oh yeah right and, and yeah. i was saying we were talking about it being gentle right and mm-hmm. i was called like a fanboy and an asshole for so long by people being like what do you care if i play both i'm like oh my god i don't mm-hmm. want to spoil it for you but at some point you have to just do it and be like listen dude it's you got to play them both. And now, and now after post Yuffie, did you play Dirge of Cerberus? Did you play the whole <laughs> compilation? How yeah, do you I feel did. about Genesis? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I love that. I wonder, do you, Oh, do you think that that was intentional? That, that the whispers are like the powers that be that want you to keep things 
pure. I think they're reflective of how the people that were directing the game would think about this whole project. So yeah, mm. I think it's intentional that way. I don't think it's high school English teacher putting all of his own things, projecting it onto the metaphor. I think it is literally in there. Um, but you know, your mileage may vary as to whether or not that works for you or not, because they did sell you a copy of a project called Final Fantasy VII Remake. Mm -hmm. And the only thing that I knew that was going to be different at the time that I bought that was that we were only going through Midgar, right? I knew they mm -hmm. made a game out of the first five hours of Final Fantasy VII. I said, I don't know how you do that, uh, but they did that. And then ghosts appear the first time you meet Aerith, and they continue appearing at random intervals later on. And I, the one that bothers me the most out of that is when they revive a person at the end. And I think we can spoil things in Remake. Uh, but when of they revive a you spoil, character... You spoil anything you want from this game. Yep. From Remake. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so when they revive Barrett, I think is when it goes a little too far for me. Yeah, I uh, hated at, that scene. <laughs> at the end. Uh, but the Whispers overall, I don't get bothered by quite as much now, five years hence, I've kind of metabolized that this is what the project is. And I said, even to people that were really upset and talking about false advertising and things, which is what they tend to bring to virtual legality when people ask questions, can we sue them for false advertising? The answer 99% <laughs> of the time is no. Uh, but while I think this walks the line between what they said they were selling and what the project actually is in certain important respects, I said to even those people that if they want to keep calling this project Final Fantasy VII, they're going to have to stick to the beats and things that you know to some extent going forward. And I think that Will Bear has borne itself out. And I will say that alone. That's that's interesting because I, I would just, if I were Square Enix's lawyers I, in a situation like that, I'd be like, it's a remake. It, it like, yeah. like what, it, it's, we, we think of it as remade faithfully. Mm -hmm. But it's just a remake, you know, like like it's the what the word and I think they could easily. It's not remake. You can remake it. Right. Like I, I, yeah. I but I understand because I, I certainly didn't think it, I had no fucking idea it was what it was when. And I remember being totally surprised and conf I was confused the second Sephiroth showed up. Mm hmm. I was like, yeah, he shows up a little early. Well, yeah, I mean, a little, his, a his little song bit. plays in the intro. It, yeah. And in the original game, Sephiroth, you don't see Sephiroth at all in Midgar. Mm -hmm. Period. He doesn't show up at all. The first time you you there is physical evidence of Sephiroth is when you see his fucking sword in the back of President Shiraz, and that's fucking scary as hell. And then and then here he's just all over the place. Like he, he's just part of the ether, you know. But that, I, I guess that's part of my big problem is that he it's is just like Sephiroth, Sephiroth, Sephiroth. And I get it. Like Sephiroth as a cultural uh, icon is already kind of everywhere. And I, I and I, I feel like the game is also kind of making a statement on that too. A little bit. You can kind of see it there. Oh yeah, so, they know where their bread uh, is buttered. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for, oh, certainly. I just think it was so. so it, like, if you take, if you take like the metaphor seriously about like what we're talking about and like kind of this meta analysis of the development of the game itself, and then also the way it redirections things and kind of makes it this almost Calvinistic like free free will. Does it exist? Like, can we change fate? Sort of thing. It's so good. Mm -hmm. like it doesn't have to be this good like that's what's so surprising about it we say this sometimes on sacred symbols like it didn't have to go that hard mm. you know it could yeah. have it would have already been so good without it makes it that much better like i think final fantasy 7 remake on some way is a i don't want to get carried away but it's like an almost last of us level game in my mind or a bioshock level game where it's like it's that good it's better i think than the original it in in a lot of different ways but it can only exist because of the original so right. you can't take anything it's away a companion from, piece to me right right Okay, yeah. Well, and that's important. Yeah. And I, I go back to the scene where Aerith is telling the group, are you sure you want to do this at the end of Final Fantasy VII Remake? Because I think that's that's really where the creators are talking to you, right? It's like, it's Stephen King at the end of the Dark Tower cycle, where he says, <laughs> you can stop reading right now if you want to. And this is still Final Fantasy VII for you. This is still the Dark Tower for you. Or yeah. you can go meet the author. You can go fight Fate Sephiroth and try to kill Fate and do these various kinds of things. And Aerith can tell you that she misses this guy uh, and all these various things at the end. They fucking removed the line in the patch. So Did they? Did they change it, right? Oh, they changed it, yeah. So now she says, <laughs> this guy, I don't like it. That's I, right. I, That's so funny because when I, 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 I just beat it two nights ago. Mm -hmm. And I, I, when she said that line, I was like, I don't remember that line. Yeah, mm -hmm. That's, okay. a, that's a new... Okay, they yeah, just, I was like, that line really stuck out to me. When, they just passed it when Rebirth came out. Oh, okay. yeah. oh interesting, because I think I actually, yeah, I it literally verbatim wrote it down sense. in my notes. Go ahead, Brad. Yeah, what the yeah. fuck is that? <laughs> I was going to say, it makes sense why they patched it. 
Yeah. So, I don't like it. I hate it. I hate it. I, I like. I love the original line. Uh, the original Aaron, line. The original line was one of my favorite things about FF Seven Remake. Period. When 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 she said that original line, I said, "I love this game. This is this is a great game. Yeah. What a great line." And then they we'll talk it. about it later, yeah. sometime in another. Oh video. yeah, yeah. We'll have to talk about it obviously <laughs> later. But yeah, in um, another life. Yeah. I will. Um. Okay, I will go forward here in my notes. I just want I'm going to go through comb through them and just pick things out that I think we can talk about. Sure. Um, yeah, let's see your notes, man. So, I wrote, you know, and I, I separated them by by chapter, but let's talk about Midgar. I mean, mm-hmm. this Brad, let's go to you. This there's like this I love the green hue of the Mako or the ma- I always say Mako cuz that's how I say it in my head. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um I always say Yuffie. Yeah. Yeah, Yuffie, right. Exactly. <laughs> that's exactly right. I said Ninja Gaiden in for many years and all that kind of stuff. So Mako, <laughs> Mako. Right. Um it's it's like this green that's almost so it, it's trying so hard to be turquoise but can't quite get there. It's this very unique green that's like totally Final Fantasy 7s. <laughs> it's so it's interesting. Nice. And I, I love this the seeing Midgar in high def is yeah, it's crazy. It's exceptional. Yeah, talk to me about this. Yeah, um, so Midgar, obviously one of the most iconic locations in gaming, I would say. Everyone knows Midgar. Everyone loves Midgar. And just seeing it the first time obviously blew me away, particularly the first part when you get to uh, Sector 7, you look up, actually, and the mu- the overworld theme starts playing, and I saw the plate above you. That's when I was like, oh, shit. Like, we're really here, dude. They're really doing this. But I mean, of course, it was just great to see a lot of the locations brought to life in this high fidelity modern scale compared to we all remember what the original looked like and how small some of the stuff was and just like the very static shots. But it was wonderful just getting to walk around through these environments, explore, going to the bar, actually, in Seventh Heaven. I was disappointed they didn't go down the elevator. Like yeah, the they don't thing. ever show it to you. Yeah, and They never show yeah, you the hideout, the which machine. is disappointing. But um yeah, just everything else I loved going through the city, particularly Aerith's house. I was blown away by that garden they had. It's beautiful. It's gorgeous. The colors. Yeah. 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 The colors are absolutely beautiful. I was frustrated actually during the flower picking scene because it forces you kind of it gives you like a false sense of it doesn't matter, but it gives you a false sense of freedom that you can go and walk up to any flower and pick it. But it, every any time you mm-hmm. try to get away from like the three flowers it wants you to pick, it just turns you around. That's mm-hmm. a, that's one thing I did want to note. And. Micah started rolling her eyes at me because I kept saying it over and over again that the game sometimes really locks you into a path. And, it, and I kept saying like, oh, I guess this isn't a role playing game. I guess I just got to go in this direction. Like the game will just turn the camera around and mm-hmm. slow walk you back to where you need to go. A little bit frustrating in that sense. But um, Midgar, yeah, unique location. Uh, Gene, I was reading a little bit about this because I, I, I didn't I was reading like the fandom Wikipedia for Final Fantasy seven remake which is really interesting. There's a lot of stuff there. I don't know how true any of it is, but I'm not reading the story. I'm not like reading the citations and shit like that um, and running it through AI or anything, but I never really thought about the world in the way that it's described in, uh, on that Wikipedia or that wiki site, which is Midgar is like the major populous center. I guess what I'm saying in Final Fantasy seven and you guys can relate to this in old Final Fantasy games. I always looked at the world map as like a it's like a an iteration of what is there but not everything is there obviously and just like when you go into a town in final fantasy 4 and it's populated by eight people and there are three houses it can't possibly be that like you're just seeing it almost like you're playing an old D game or something well, mm-hmm. on a map like mm-hmm. a top-down map mm-hmm. and um i feel like i never really thought about so i thought about final fantasy 7 as being actually a world much more populated than it actually is and that Midgar really is like the center of I knew it was the center of like their civilization but the really the center of all things I guess it's it was it was pressed into me more how important this particular location is and how industrial it is but I love the idea of how it's it's having such an adverse effect on the earth or the planet that like everything around it's dying and then mm-hmm. starts to thrive further away from it so do you have any thoughts you want to share on Midgar uh well, in, in terms of a nostalgia factor, I feel like, you know, when Brad was talking about how when he saw the plate and that was when it hit, hit for him, for me, it was actually when we were just walking up to Seventh Heaven, just like right there at the beginning, like right after the bombing run. And then you see Tifa on the, on the, on the stairs and you're like, that's her, man. 
I mean, you hear her, her theme song. Like every time, every time I play that part, I start tearing up because it's like going back home, and then like your girl is still there too. That's crazy, you know. And then the music is, and then the, the and then Tifa's theme is just so, so perfect. So, um, it's interesting what you said about uh, about the the map layout, though. I really love that. I always had some weird issue getting in the original FF Seven. I had some weird issue getting used to Midgar as a rpg town you know what i'm saying because mm-hmm. mm-hmm. like you, you go you go to uh ff6 and then there's god what was the first t- town in ff6 but you Narsh. go to like Narsh. Narsh, that's right but then you go to like figaro castle and it's very mm-hmm. it's, it's very very structured and then there's enough beds for each npc and there's an inn and a weapon shop and then you go to midgar and it's just a complete mess of uh, uh, like even back then you, you couldn't even tell where you were going but like in midgar it's just a complete mess of massive it's like the, the shit stain cover cities that you always rail about, uh, Colin, right? But then that the, they're they're actually able to adapt it into FF seven, and as and I, you know, as Hogue, I, I'm such a huge fan of FF six. For me, FF six was like the formative video game, like in terms of like, you know, expanding my literary sense. You know, yeah, uh, that's where movie. I decided that games could tell really, really <clears throat> evocative stories. Same, same, exactly how I felt, right? And then for me, with FF7, I thought it was so interesting because in FF6, the, the Empire is a bad guy and then you end up at the capital, right? And in FF7, you just start at the capital. You start within the Empire. I always love, uh, I, I did always love that inverse thing. And then you're escaping from the, the Empire at first. But then, yeah, yeah and I love FF7 how early you get it's just like AQ, all, right? this is all Imperial, this is all an Imperial base, but with lives in there with flowers and everything it's it's a it's it is one of the most iconic if not the most iconic video game like town ever Mm -hmm. you know and it's frustrating because as i was i mean it's not frustrating it's how the story goes but as i recall you guys can correct me in final fantasy 7 you couldn't go back to midgar but you could walk into it and it would be like a static pre-rendered screen of like debris right or something stopping you see you see the wall there's there's a little wall that's what it is yeah yeah yeah. right 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 Right. which they kind of have an o2 and this is well many odes, of course. Um, yeah, shout out to Midgar. Um, Ho, do you have anything you want to add about about the famous city? Only that Midgar is one of the more obvious metaphor of metaphor type towns, and this goes on throughout the overworld in Final Fantasy VII. Uh, having a plate of rich people above the slums, actually having that metaphor be very physically enacted later on in the story, so good. is is very good storytelling. And Mm -hmm. one of the things I really like about Midgar and the Final Fantasy VII Remake project is I think Square got away from this a little bit. They they decided that they wanted to get away from some of their more zany kind of designs or approaches or specific metaphors like Midgar. And I think that the Remake project helps to remind players as well as Square Enix exactly how effective those were, right? So you have... Things like Midgar, you have things further on in the world that are very specific and very different from each other and help bring a world together in a way that wasn't done in something like Final Fantasy 16, which I really like, or or certainly the Final Fantasies that took a little bit longer to come out in between 13 and 16. Uh, And so I think Midgar is remembering what Square Enix used to do. And I think it was remembering for them as well as for us. And my hope is that this whole project continues to bring that to Final Fantasy and to the other games that they make mm-hmm. is to remember that that kind of craziness can work even in the modern era, right? If you look at Midgar, one of my favorite things is that like the neon signage or the various things that you find still have that kind of nineties patina. They still have the look of something coming up from the, the upper camera and looking down at something that says eggs on the wall and just eggs put it and, there. Eggs and chips, baby. Eggs, yeah, eggs and chips. Yeah. Eggs and chips. That sounds and, so and it, good. I want that and shit. And it works just what it works just fine, right? You look at it and you say, that's an interesting vibe. And then you think about it and you go, well, it's the vibe that they created from having pre-rendered backgrounds and trying to make things pop. Uh, and it still works mm. from this angle. Mm. Mm. And I, I just love that that was brought over to this mm. when you could have kind of smoothed all that out and made it a more 2020 Mm. kind of looking thing and they didn't right they brought some of that 90s-ness over Mm. Mm. and i think that's that's a good thing as well and obviously that's a great point man obviously the fact that midgar is killing the area around it is brought to the fore with the intro video being what it is now and is greater emphasized i think in in remake than it was even in the original obviously in the original they are eco-terrorists. They do look at this thing that is being done with the Mako and the live stream and the reactors and say these have to be blown up. 
but it's even more direct and specific in remake. And I think that's intentional, obviously. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I think it works even better than it did in 1997, honestly. Yeah. Thematically. Yeah. I, I, it's funny how, well, two things, because Final Fantasy VI is coming up so often, and that's a game that's near and dear to my heart too. My favorite Final Fantasy game for sure. Maybe mm-hmm. before it would even be second. I think seven would maybe be third. That's um, actually my order. Yeah, yeah. It's, I, I go six, four, seven. Yeah, that's mm-hmm. that's about right. I think for me, mm-hmm. and nine mm-hmm. would be in there, and mm-hmm. and uh, as well. But it's funny. One thing in playing Final Fantasy VII remake again recently, which I didn't appreciate the first time through, we. We intuitively know that seven, six, and seven are similar games to each other. It's like, okay, instead of Esper's, we have Materia. Instead of this, we have that. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of mm-hmm. this evolution. It's still active time battle in the original games and all the rest. But I didn't realize how literal it was in, so, in some way. It, just right on down to some of the, the thematic things we were talking about. Um, but even having like another world where special people live that harness magic and they're very naturalistic and there's this you know in it's like uh vector and the empire and gestal and all that and sixth but in this it's like a corporation but they're very similar they're totally echoes and i never really appreciated that as deeply as i did after playing it this most recent time there's mm-hmm. nothing wrong with that of course because six is a great game to invoke mm-hmm. but it also reminds me i don't know if you guys saw recently they were asked i don't know if it was namora that was asked or someone but that what about six? Will you guys ever remake six? And they, they said something like it would take 20 years or something to remake six. Like they remade seven. And for me, I'm like, why does it, why do you need to envision remaking it like that? Seven's remake seems so unique to it. And mm-hmm. in, in the set, not in changing things, but in a way it, it kind of tells a multi, multi-layered story about what's happening. Um, all I so, ever wanted was yeah. six with Octopath Traveler graphics. That's yeah, all I exactly. want. Don't overthink it. It's like what they're doing with Dragon Quest three. That's a fantastic game. And, and they're doing they're giving it that very treatment. Mm-hmm. Or so, even, a brave, even a bravely default vibe too. Uh, sure. or j- God, just even make it like a P- look, make it look like a PS2 game. I don't care. It's fine. You know, <laughs> I got to say, actually, like, I don't I don't know if I, I'm sorry, Brad, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Please. I was going to say, I actually want if they're going to remake six, I want them to go all in on six. I don't know. Mm-hmm. I, I, don't want to take, I don't want it to take 20 years, though, man. I'm no, not no, going to no, be no, alive yeah. for the end of that. I think it I'm going to be, be 62 game. years old when they fucking finish <laughs> Final Fantasy VI Remake, man. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to be 62 years old when, 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 I'm, when, when I'm playing Final Fantasy VI Remake. That's crazy. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I don't, I don't think it would take that long. Take long. You know? <laughs> um, I want them to do like one game, but I think it should be very high fidelity game. To me, they already have Pixel Remasters. They have like three versions of six already. And it's just young and man's privilege. Already, that, that's what I'm hearing. I don't I love the pixel young, young people privilege. I that's personally I don't want uh, HD 2D for that game. I don't think they should do that. I think they should really? do something bold with it. Yeah, I think they have enough HD 2D games already, and I think they're great. But I'm kind of bo- like not blown away by that visual style yeah. as much as I was anymore. I think they should do, make fair. it look really good really good like seven good but it doesn't it could be very similar to six i don't think you have to like do crazy storyline stuff or anything like that just make it really high fidelity really mm. high budget game yeah, it's interesting because i'm so protective of six and four where i wasn't so protective of seven where i wasn't like immediately mm-hmm. like re- re- revolted by the idea of someone remaking it but i don't how do you guys feel about this i mean this is kind of a tangent but Four is a very emotionally powerful game for me too. You know, poor Mapalum sacrifice, like all of the crazy things that happen. And I was like, whoa, man. Dagan always <laughs> talks of. about that. Like, how can this be in this game that looks like this? But when they remade Final Fantasy IV on DS and mm-hmm. they gave it that 3D aesthetic, I have to say it really, I mean, it's a good game, but it, it really killed the emotion of the game for me. It looked fucking, because the game looked so bad in my opinion. Mm. And I wonder if, I, like I don't want to say the emotion, the emotion won't resonate, but like, is it in its best state right now in the pixel remasters for those particular games? What would I love 6 be like if it was in, in 3? What did you say, Hulk? I love the remasters. And again, going back to what I was saying about remake, uh, it's because the remasters have that uh, symphonic score, right? They take all that music and they make it really beautiful. And this was some of the best music ever in video games. Uh, and so I think the remasters actually do like, two thirds of what I would want these projects to do anyway. So mm. I really like them. I like to be able to walk diagonally in final fantasy. That's really awesome. <laughs> and I like listening to that music. Uh, so yeah, I think the mm. pixel remasters are, are worth it. I know there are things that people don't like about them, uh, but I think they are excellent projects and I don't need a four or a six remade as much as I needed seven because 
that particular style in 1997 with the full motion video and the pre-rendered backgrounds didn't survive as well as some of the pixel-based video games. So mm-hmm. I think the 7 Remake project was necessary. I think it's gorgeous, and I'm glad it exists, and I, I'm not as worried about 6 and 4. Yeah, I, I maybe some things are better left alone, but it would be interesting at the same time to see what it would really because when they re, when they release five, you guys will remember when they released five and six and four and Chrono Trigger on PS1, mm-hmm. they gave them all those FMV intros and all the different videos. And you kind of got to look at everything for the first time. It was the first time I realized what Kefka really like really looked like, uh, mm-hmm. for, according to Squaresoft at the time. Maybe it is better left alone. But at the same time, yeah, seeing this really amazing, you know, what we're going to see with this long rumored Final Fantasy nine remake, I think, is maybe some middle ground. Because it's mm. supposed to be, it's real because it's in the NVIDIA leak. Yeah. And I think there was a rumor about it recently about how it's like, it is one game. Like, and mm-hmm. I want to see what they're doing with that and why they're comfortable going in that direction with that and mm. and so on and so forth. So maybe we'll get an mm-hmm. answer sooner that rather than later. But yeah, maybe. Um, let's go over to this. Because we talked about so many things that are already in my notes, but I, we haven't talked about Avalanche yet. There's right. so many different ways to talk about this, but I have a new theory about this. It, it requires me to go to my last page because of the Yuffie expansion. So this idea that, I mean, maybe I'm misreading this, but Wutai and Avalanche are interconnected, right? Like there's this idea in Final Fantasy seven remake, especially through Barrett, that there's like, they're almost offended that they're, they're being like that. They're being in the, in the propaganda that Shinra is putting out. Part of it is that like the Wutai resistance or whatever is helping Avalanche, but they are. And that was made that was made to seem be seen. Am I misinterpreting that? So it's almost well, like Barrett and the Splinter Cell is, are out of the loop or whatever. Yeah, yeah. the Splinter yeah. Cell is important to that, right? right. Because Wu Tai is kind of getting a regloss in the remake project, and the fact that Avalanche is bigger than Barrett is a is a regloss. Mm-hmm. And and Barrett's team is essentially the the ones that want to blow stuff up more than Avalanche proper. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they're the extremists. Yeah. Those are all vibes that come in the remake project that didn't exist in the original. So I think they're playing with various things about how you feel about terrorism and ecology and what amounts to international relations, even though Shinra isn't a city state technically or a nation state, uh, they act very much like one in final fantasy. So you get all of that baked into that plot line. Uh, but no, I don't think you're reading it wrong. Wu Tai is involved with the things that are destabilizing Shinra, uh, but not necessarily with Barrett's group. And so you get both kind of at play at the same time. Well, that, that's what's so interesting to me, um, Brad. And I'd be interested to hear what you have to mm-hmm. say about all this, these connections as well. But it, it like like much many pieces of propaganda, there are sometimes traces of truth in the propaganda right. to ground it in reality. And what we don't realize as players in Final Fantasy VII Remake is that Shinra isn't lying about the Wutai Avalanche connection. They're just lying about the much more key component of what happened to the plates. Right. Right. They are. So, so I, but so and I found that so the interesting. Yeah. That's new too. And the reactors, right? Of course. And Jesse's all guilt about all that, even though it, was, it wasn't mm-hmm. her. Like, so anyway, what do you have to say about that, Brad? To me, I just read it differently. Right. It, it makes integrate so essential. Because it, it, for me, it flipped it all on its head where it's like, actually, Shinra is not lying about everything. They're yeah, just yeah, they're obviously, not, they're obviously evil, but they're, yeah, they, yeah. they're rooted in some sort of reality. Yeah, yeah, they're not lying about that. But they, yeah, like you said, the plate is the big thing they're hiding. I actually like it because it connects. It makes sense, especially with Crisis Core, kind of like the war they talk about, but the war with Wutai, they had Shinra and all that kind of stuff. So it makes sense to me that some group sections of Wutai, you know, freedom fighters, I guess, would want to team up with Avalanche and do all this stuff. But um, yeah, I just think it was a nice extra layer to flesh out the world more and make it feel bigger because it is. Yeah, it's well said. I, and I wonder, Gene, for you, because we, we brought up kind of the 90s-ness and Hogue brought it up too of, of the game, but also the content. Uh, I did say in the earlier episode something that I'll reiterate here, which is that Though environmentalism is really, as we understand it today, is really from the 19th century. And though as the United States, like Earth Day and all that, it's like very 70s sort of vibe. The 90s were, if you were there and we all were, were very much a time of like recycle, Mm -hmm. Um, turn Mm -hmm. off your lights. And and like when you get energy star stickers on everything for the first time and all these different (laughs) things. And what's funny about it to me is that they didn't have to adjust one single thing for it to still be relevant, highly relevant today. 
and maybe even more relevant, not for environmentalism itself, which is its own thing, but in increasingly aggressive ways that people are going to start dealing with this stuff, which you're seeing not to the extent of like personal violence yet, but it's getting there. And it reminds me of people chasing boats around in the 90s and shit like that. And like Greenpeace, like intercept, you know, whalers and <laughs> and shit like that. So I was really enamored with the idea that they really didn't have to adjust anything to make it timely, which is somewhat unusual in fiction. Yeah. In the 90s, uh, remember, we had to worry about the ozone layer. Remember? Right. Right. Like the, mm-hmm. the, we, we never hear about the ozone layer anymore. Is it still around? I think I think it was. I think they, they made it finally kill it. I think they made a change in aerosols. Insane, you, say is, you know, <laughs> it was all about aerosols, right? And like they made it some sort of change that fixed it, like or like started to heal it. Like we identified the problem. You know, a little bit. Of I'm human not going to pretend to be qualified enough for this conversation. I think that that's you, what you're happened. Right. Like, we used to hear about it. Yeah, I think I do believe that that's what happened. It was. It was. Um, I can't think of it. It's an acronym, but it's CFC like, is car fluorocarbons. Right. Right. And and uh and they they identified that and fixed it. So hopefully we can continue to do those kinds of things for our planet. But um, yeah. I remember CFCs. Yes. Uh, so yeah. No, I think you're absolutely right. It does hold today, and it makes sense. And I think with the greater fidelity, it's even more apparent what the plot is. Like I think with your little Lego people, you go and you blow up the reactor and all these various things that you do early on in Final Fantasy VII. It doesn't quite feel the same as when you do it in remake, right? And they did a really good job in the second chapter of this game to really blow out that scene where they're leaving the reactor. And in the first game, you kind of go through a couple of pre-rendered scenes and people are a little bit crying and a little bit screaming and running around and you make your way to the train and get out of there. And in this one, it's like a whole sequence of people going like, I don't have jobs. I hope my son got out of there and people are dead on that block. Don't go that way, that kind of thing. And you really realize that this was, this was a major act that you did right at the start of this game. And also, Colin, to your point about extremist political activism, you know, it 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 it, it is cool that it doesn't hasn't seemed to age, and it just seems to become more relevant. You know, there is a there is an ongoing like debate within like the, the the liberals and the left and the leftists about how extreme they should be. You know, like regular more centric Democrats don't think that the the don't abro- a sc- the, prescribed by more leftist extremist views a little bit stuff that is just a little bit more disruptive to society but then of course leftists feel or or just activists in general feel that they should be more disruptive because that's the only way you can get Mm -hmm. anyone to pay attention you know and then and and then we see the the playfall right of of sector seven which was basically which is basically the 9-11 of of final fantasy 7 and then we all know that 9-11 was an inside job in Final Fantasy VII. So. <laughs> it, it was. It was. And we it also, really was an inside job in Final Fantasy VII. And we also you know? know, yeah, and Nomura, he ended up taking out the line, but Barrett originally said, this is our 9-11. Um, and, but no That's one, right. Yeah, so. Um, <laughs> but, he, but he took that out as well. Yeah, I, I love, I love, um, there is something to the point about it being so more, so much more overtly terroristic. Mm-hmm. And, Ooh. You're not playing because, again, Final Fantasy six echoes. You're kind of playing as a gray person, like a gray antagonist or a protagonist in Locke mm-hmm. in the beginning. Right. And of mm-hmm. course, Celis mm-hmm. is deeply gray as well. Terra's confused. I love Celis. Yeah, Celis is dope. I mean, and their relationship is awesome, too. But and we'll keep that for you. Know, I don't want to spoil six for people. <laughs> well, yeah, 30, I feel like we had, should just be talking about FF six sometimes. You've had 30, sure. years, to this, you had 30 <laughs> years to play it. Yeah, yeah. Please play, please, please play FF6. It's an amazing game. But um, yeah, you can play it right now on PS4, on Switch, on PC. You have all sorts of ways to play it. But I like that though they are environmental terrorists, it, do, it still seems gray. Like you obviously, it's not unusual for us to find fiction where you obviously sympathize with the bad guys in quotes, but they are the bad guys. And I do love that. I don't remember in the, I, again, Final Fantasy VII has so much dialogue, I don't remember, but it seems like and I think Ho, you brought this up earlier, but that like the there is a struggle amongst them about what they're doing. Tifa. You see it isolated within their own group, so they blow it up, pardon the pun, to a much bigger group where they're kind of the out cell in this larger terrorist organization. It actually makes a lot more sense because it, you would wonder like how do they even have this much power or know how to do something like infiltrate the the reactor until you realize they're being allowed to do it mm. and they're being framed. Um, but I, I, I dig it. I, I, I dig the, I dig the perception that Tifa has like a lot of reservations about what mm-hmm. they're doing. 
that she sees that like innocent people are dying. Barrett is very gung ho and hard headed about the situation, like deeply terroristic in some way. Right. Like, he understands what yeah, time that's, it is. Like, can, yeah. Can't you hear the planet cloud? And, right. and I, I think cloud's response is you're nuts uh, and all these things. Get help. Yeah. Get help <laughs> at this point. And it, it just makes so much sense. Right. Cause that's, that's your Twitter answer to anybody being passionate about anything is cloud just being like, what? <laughs> I'm here for the money. Give me my mm-hmm. gill. Uh, and yeah, Barrett has such good lines. I, and I love Barrett's delivery throughout this entire game. Barrett uh, is the biggest glow up in the, in, in the remake. Uh, series. I was so <laughs> worried about how Barrett would turn out because yeah, no. he's such an over the top character. Do you guys all see uh, that, that dual shockers uh, piece? I oh, I haven't read it, but I saw it circulating. I, didn't I read saw it. the headline, but it didn't I make a lot of line. sense to me. Very bad headline. The piece is not is is better. It's not that much better, but but the headline is just terrible. But but basically, the, the Dual Shockers just published a piece that says Final Fantasy. Uh, I'm tired of of black characters being the comedy relief in Final Fantasy games. Um, yeah, that's not the comedy, comedy like, relief. They didn't it's, play I mean, the like, game. That's what it sounds I, like. It's yeah. like. That's weird because I mean Barrett is not really comedy relief. I mean he's a funny guy, but like everyone is funny in FF. Even mm-hmm. Cloud is funny, you know. So well, Cloud you know. just has all that dry delivery that makes him. Yeah, play yeah, all yeah. The time. You know, I mean the the article later has a point that you know maybe Barrett didn't need to be so loud, but then like the whole point of characters, uh, the the whole point of the character is that he is a loud extremist terrorist, right? So right. I mean, you're just at this point, you're just asking for a different story, which I well, guess maybe, maybe that's sympathetic. what they were doing. It's like maybe in future Final Fantasies, uh, you know, you have a more introspective black guy uh, uh, around, which is fine. Um, I just, do think it, it's it wrong, really especially to highlight Barrett on it. So, I'm sorry. I do oh. think it's wrong, especially to highlight Barrett on that. But I do have some amount of sympathy if you just watch like the first scene of Barrett or something like that. I sure, do think he comes sure. across a, a little bit like Mr. T just rolled into Final Fantasy. Uh, and sure. I really I mean, do. But that's part of, but that's part of the, the, the trick, right? Like he, he seems that like, is, a, like, that he is seems trick. like a caricature himself. And then once you get to know him, it's like, oh, this guy actually ha- has a lot going on, right? So that is the trick. Everybody in Final Fantasy VII has a lot going on. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, that's like the first like few hours of the characters. Mm-hmm. Like you have to play the game actually to learn about the characters. <laughs> Yeah. But, oh, God forbid. No, nobody, nobody plays that's games. That's fair, forbid. Brad. That's fair. No, nobody's playing games yeah. these days, though, so whatever. No, it seems like people complain about it. It seems like games sell a lot. And then, mm-hmm. like, I was setting up Sacred Symbols this weekend. Uh, it Takes Two sold 16 million copies. It's like, holy wow. shit. Good for them. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, it's awesome. And holy they said 30 shit, million dude. players cumulatively, I guess, because it was on. Holy shit. Or... 16 million? Yeah, that's crazy. Wow. Good, good, for, good, for, good for Ferris. Yeah, yeah, yeah right, it's man. awesome. <laughs> Um, but then you see, so you see sales numbers like that and you realize people are just playing these games, you know, 16 million people are playing these games in the background. And then you have just people complaining about the same old things right? that don't play games. That's why I, I know people think it's lame, but like, I'm like, I want to see people's trophies and achievements. Like if they're, if they're really going crazy about a game, I need to know that you've played it. It's important for mm-hmm. me to people for, that people can see what I've played so they can hold me to account about the things say, I say, you know, Colin, I can show you my, like whatever the end game trophy is for these kinds of things, but I can't show you the other trophies that are for you. You held a guy up in the air for 23 seconds yeah. or whatever it might be. That's the only thing that matters. It's not about the platinum or, achi- or the completion percentage. It's simply about knowing that people play these things. There's, you can't hide it anymore. It's yeah, like, I can show the level trophies, the end game trophy. Right. I can't, I can't show that you're really good at this trophy. There's a lot of people. Bullshitting generally out speaking, there. I'm not. There, there are a lot of people <laughs> bullshitting out there. And that's why they hide the achievements and trophies so they can continue to have these arguments and conversations while never having to prove that they've actually played the game. And I think some people watch videos on YouTube and then pretend that they've also yes, played the games. Definitely. Yeah. Um, and for everyone who check, who's trying to check my trophies, I have to hide have the hit them because every NDA sometimes you I, do. Yeah. Every NDA <laughs> I sign it requires that I that I have them hidden. So it sucks. I'll show my trophies. I don't have no. I have no problem with them. I have I have a shit ton of trophies. So yeah, you better. No, I'm liking. Um, <laughs> All right. it's, it's, it was requirement before hire, getting hired by yeah, Colin. It's going to be no added one, to the last stand media contract. No <laughs> one in the entire family, LSM family, cares about a tro- achievement or trophies except for me. No one. No, that's true. Not a single person. I do sometimes. Only if it's oh. a games I'm really into. Yeah, you you like. We have to become friends on. Uh, I don't think we're friends PSN? on PSN. Yeah. Not that it's really usable for me because it's in a, it's like I, I'm maxed out on friends. So I just see a yeah. bunch of anonymous people all the time. But it would be nice. We should we should connect yeah. on there. Um, okay. I did write this in my notes here and we're getting nowhere through my notes, but that's okay. Maybe we can do two episodes or something. I don't want to hold you guys here forever, but um, why, why are they so oblivious that they're getting done, things done so easily? It's no. not weird to them. It, 
this plays so much more obvious in this version of the game in some mm-hmm. way where it's like it's mm-hmm. bru- it's at times brutal. It's like, how do you not know that you're being let you think you guys are this good? It doesn't make any sense. You jumped off the train and they stopped looking for you. They didn't mm-hmm. they didn't go and look for you or you, you there's three of you just what you're killing soldiers. You're killing them and mm-hmm. no one is calling for recruits. There are no cameras. It, it doesn't. They're so there's surprised cameras. when they're I'm sorry. I think there's cameras. They record them doing. No, stuff no, I'm, I'm saying sure. in their minds, there are no, oh, yeah. there are no, there are none of these oh, things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They're, that's they're, the hubris of them. Yeah, as it's, a group. it's it's so, but it's so ridiculous that when they turn the propaganda on them and realize that they're live on TV or whatever, on Shinra's yeah. network or whatever, it's like, really, you're that surprised? Like you, yeah. how did this yeah. happen so easily? And I, then you got away and you like, they let you go back to your base. Like they know where you are there. You're like an asset. Mm-hmm. It's so obvious to me and it frustrated me that that they didn't see it. You know? I think that's part of like characters, particularly Barrett with his anger, you know, his history with Shinra and all that stuff. That's what's really driving him. And he's not really thinking about all that stuff till it all comes tumbling down. You know, he was just so gung ho about taking down Shinra. The only thing he cared about was Marlene and taking down Shinra. So when he starts seeing other people get affected by it and that he is being toyed with, it's character growth for him, in my opinion. Him realizing that he needs to chill out somewhat, slow down and think about what he's doing. What were you going to say, Gene? I think it just reflects like the, early, the, like the early era of writing in that the characters, you kind of require the characters to be just a little stupid, you know? Um, yeah. Because like even in the conversations, like there's so much more that you can actually find out about Cloud or Tifa or whatever, but they just don't say it, you know? Yeah, it's fair. It's fair. Yeah, I'm always yeah. frustrated. <laughs> the, there are random things in fiction. Like I always talk about how it bothers me that people don't say goodbye when they hang up the phone on, on TV and movies. It's like, no one does that. Like no one does. No one just hangs up the phone. On you. Yeah. yeah. Like after you say what you need to say, you just say it. But I don't know. It's so strange. I will say the character that I. And, and Hogue, I wonder what you think of this. The character that I sympathize with by far the most outside. I, I sympathize with Tifa and Aerith, obviously, to, to their own extent, but is truly Jesse. Um, just because. Yeah, I why. yeah. First of all, <laughs> Jesse's my favorite, no doubt. But she. Her bomb didn't even go off. You know, and she thinks that not only did her bomb go off in the reactor, but that it was way more powerful. And she lives with this guilt and has no idea that she didn't do anything wrong and takes major risks that were above and beyond and unnecessary and put them out in order to rectify this thing that ever actually happened. Like she was just in way over her head. And uh, I sympathize with her. I wonder. If, what you thought of Jesse and the other Avalanche characters too, of course, Biggs and Wedge. We get more texture out of them in, in this and two, and we meet in we meet other Avalanche members. I guess both at the base in some kind of s- small way, and then in the DLC in a in a more major way. Yeah, and and Jesse, you want to talk about glow ups? Uh, that's a great vocal performance from that actress. Uh, and Erkelin I do sometimes call Final Fantasy VII "Everybody Wants Cloud" because everybody wants Cloud all the time. Uh, and Jesse obviously falls into that pattern, and that's an interesting dynamic as well. I I don't know that I actually followed the thread of the original bomb and Jesse as much as the thread of visiting her on the top of the plate and getting to see some of the stuff about how Shinra. Uh, middle management lives. Mm-hmm. Uh, I enjoyed some of that from the kind of world building aspect of it. That's all new so in I this like, one, right? That was yeah, all new. That was yeah. incredible shit. Yeah. That was like we that never was see the best. top of the plate. I don't think in the end. we've yeah. never been to the top of the right. plate. That was the best addition yeah. uh, uh, cool. to, to this to this version for sure. Cool. Go ahead. Yeah, and we get some you know jumping off of high places, which is always a good addition to any story. And Roche, uh, Roche too. <laughs> well, how do you guys yeah, feel so about well, Roche? We can talk That's about Roche. Roche. I'm not. I'm not certain how I feel about Roche. That's. That's not my favorite addition to the to the remake. I project. didn't realize how deeply homoerotic it was until Micah pointed it out to me because I was just everybody like, wants oh, cloud. Because I'm like, I'm like, oh, they're bros. Everybody <laughs> wants cloud. Everybody wants cloud. <laughs> oh, they're roommates. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> exactly. I had an uncle. I had an uncle. My uncle is my mom's uncle Vito, who had a roommate for like 40 years. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Uh, All right. Yeah. Oh, so, I'm sorry. You have more you want to say, Hulk? 
No, no, I, okay. I'm good. So I'm I'm just peeling through my notes here, looking at the one <laughs> vertical blinds in a Final Fantasy game. I wrote. That's interesting. I don't know why I noticed <laughs> that. What do we think about the materia system? Final Fantasy games are often known for their. Usually, there's a central nub of a gameplay system. I guess beginning in three, although it gets four, it's really not. It's there, but you can't really fuck around with it. Five obviously gets very deep. And then six, you get Esper's, seven, Materia, eight, the junction system and so on. So how do we feel about it both in its on an, in and of itself and the way it compares and contrasts to um, other magic systems in Final or gameplay systems in Final Fantasy? And also as a postscript, and Brad, let's go to you first on this. Mm-hmm. What do we also think about the additions to the upgrade system? Because I do think one of my complaints about the game, if I have one, is that it's like it doesn't need to be so deep on... <laughs> The statistical do level, like do you upgrading, mean like the- upgrading weapons constantly, and like oh, it's like yeah. I don't know, I don't want this level of statistical control. I think having I, like in yeah. the original, what was it? It was weapon, accessory, armor, material slots, and then yeah. you had your material slots built into it, and that mm-hmm. was it. And then your mm-hmm. limit breaks. In mm-hmm. this, it gets a little too deep for me. But other than that, I, I think it's pretty workable. I th- I agree with you on the weapon upgrading, like the tree or whatever, just upgrading stuff. It gets I just automatically do me. it once I li- once I learned I could do that. I just automatically did it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's just kind of like redundant to me after a while, especially if you're swapping between weapons a lot, like I do. Uh, but the material system, it's my favorite system in any rpg honestly just from the pure amount of flexibility it gives you you can do like you can make any character whatever you want and if you really experiment with this system there's so much depth to it you can do crazy ass things in the games like if you spend the time and experiment that's what i really love about it. it's there's so much flexibility to it i love straightforward systems though too you were kind of talking about four like i think that's totally fine but the material system just allowed me as a player to just try out new things. And I really love that kind of stuff in games. Like when you, and especially when you get like a really satisfying combination, like when you make the crazy thing where you can just auto resurrect late in like late game, original final Fantasy seven. I love that you're able to do that kind of stuff. So to me, it's one of the greatest systems ever in gaming. Yeah. The material system itself is, is deeper than it seems takes, right. I remember feeling the same way about the Esper system, like not realizing how the percentages correlated with the AP, correlated with learning spells permanently. Mm-hmm. And I loved the level of control six gave you in that regard. Seven doesn't really inherently give you that level of control. Six is kind of a mix of four and seven in that it has like its own Esper system, but then everyone has their own thing to like tools or blue magic yeah. or whatever the case might be. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, Love tools. Tool. Yeah. Oh, me too. Uh, chainsaw and the cr- auto crossbow. I, 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 oh, yeah, dude. Mm-hmm. Ed- Edgar Figueroa, man. I fucking love that guy. My favorite yeah, Ed- character. Edgar and Sabin or Sabin, however you say it. So I think it's it Sabin. I think Sabin. So, I don't know. Oh. I've said almost everything wrong when I was a kid in my head. So. <laughs> yeah. I do. I used to pronounce Guile as Geely, man. So don't Geely. worry about it. I, my Geely? neighbor said my neighbor my that. neighbor said Gully, so it's funny that you. <laughs> oh were, man, dude, that's you were funny. fucking idiots, man. Yeah. <laughs> I knew it was my friend used to it's say, a word, you know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's a word. Said. I didn't know that fucking word. <laughs> no, I was like ten. I know. I know. <laughs> um, dude, my I'm friend sorry. used to say Chocobo instead of Chocobo. Oh, Chocobo! Holy I, shit! Oh, I still say <laughs> Chocobo. I still say Chocobo all the time. Oh, it's Chocobo. I have a really bad one, which is Chocoboo. Mm. Oh, I, I remember people would say that. Yeah. Chocoboo sounds good, though. Chocoboo yeah. was what I used to call it back in the day, too. Yeah, I don't know where I got that from because it's it, it wouldn't be. Like, the, it's only one O. You know, some yeah. kid just said Choco, Chocobo. That's what everyone said. Chocoboo. I probably am the one that infected so many people around me with like bad pronunciations that they still yeah. do to this day. Ninja Gaiden is the biggest one. It I was think. all just text, folks. It was all text. Yep. Yeah, we didn't yeah, it know. It was all text. Yeah, well, they, they, that, that's how they pronounce Ninja Gaiden in the Wizard movie, too. That's right. Like, yeah, they do. Oh, they Ninja Gaiden is the final game. I'm like, oh, fuck, dude. Yeah. That's <laughs> why Kingdom Hearts is a big deal when they said some of the characters' names, actually, like Tidus. We're like, yep. whoa, it's not Titus? Yep. What? Yep. Yep. <laughs> they always have to make the annoying, like, why can't it just be Titus? I don't know. Like, are you kidding? What? Titus? <laughs> Come on, man. Yeah, yeah. no, no. Just, I, I thought it was Titus for the longest now time. you're just too. being annoying. Yeah. You know? <laughs> All right. Hey, one of the things that I wanted to bring up was 
So wait, can I, I want to say oh, something about Materia oh, System. Oh yeah, no, go ahead. I'm sorry, Gene. Yeah, yeah, no, please. no, no. I, 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 I have always missed the Materia System ever since FF7. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's, like, it's so good to have it back, man. It's my favorite system. And and to echo uh, what Hoag said, this is my favorite. Uh, this, to go beyond, this is my favorite RPG combat action system ever. Period. Better than Witcher Three. Better than any, better than Bethesda <laughs> games. <laughs> better. Well, I do like Twelve actually. I love the Gambit <laughs> system. Yeah, uh, yo, I, I think Gambit's fun. 12 yeah, Gambit's fun. It, 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 FF12 is the closest thing to a Madden game, basically. You know. Um, <laughs> yeah. Oh, I love programming my little characters, but yeah, I don't yeah, consider yeah. that the same kind of visceral. For sure, yeah. Uh, but like the material system is so, uh, uh, especially in the original game, is so um, um, loose, and you can just do anything. Yeah. But then, yeah, I could just play. Honestly, I could just play the FF7 combat system forever. If they just make this the main combat system for a regular series, I'd be perfectly happy. So. Oh yeah, bring it over. Final mm-hmm. Fantasy 17. You heard it here, folks. Yeah, please do. And, so, well, and you make, can bring that Final, Final Fantasy 17. 16 codex over the other way if you want. Yeah. Lots of good thoughts. Lots of good ideas. So just this is just a throwaway thing, but I really did love the the scene with Aerith and Cloud when they meet for the oh, first yeah. time. It's so mm-hmm. cute. It's always great. That's the Aerith theme playing yeah. good stuff. And she says shit. <laughs> And it's obviously this is the I think this is the first time we see the whispers in the game too, right? Maybe not yeah. the first time, but yeah. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. The, first, the very first time they meet. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. The first meet cute. Okay. Yeah, when she touches him. Mm. Yeah, and he sees like. Yeah. Well, yeah. So that's pretty cool. And then I did like we didn't. I don't know how much of this. Again, I don't remember the dialogue, like the NPC dialogue in Final Fantasy VII when you're in like outside of Seventh Heaven and all that, and in the slums, but. I do dig that if you walk around, there's just a lot of chatter and chirping and there's a lot of skepticism about what Avalanche is doing, which right. is which is cool. I don't does that read as much in the first game? I don't remember it really reading that much um, where the people, dialogue is very thin there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. There's not like a lot of a lot to say. No, they did a really good job of of increasing your understanding of sector seven, sector five and the various places with that kind of chatter approach. I really think Square Enix solved the HD towns kind of problem with this chattering. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, the only problem I have with it is in certain circumstances where you're following someone or you've got a cut scene playing where they can overlap and just kind of overwhelm you with sound. But overall the chatter is enough to get what you're going to get from a, an old school RPG where you'd go and press X three times, Mm -hmm. get the same kind of notion of the world. uh, And in a way that, that square has figured out players will like in 2020 and 2024. That chattering system is from final fantasy 13. That's fine. Uh It is. It is. They took it from there. So they took the good but parts. But didn't have any towns. It, yeah. It, well, there, there, there are parts that, that are supposed to be towns. They're not towns. Touché. But there's supposed to be towns they're where not. there's NPCs around. They're not towns. They're hallways. But then that's where the chatter system was. And then they took that good <laughs> idea and they put it into a, a much better game. So, And that's <laughs> how game design should work. I, yes, I yes. like 13. That's great. But I missed yeah. towns and Final Fantasy VII Remake and, and Rebirth bring towns back. And one of the, what, what, absolutely one of the worst things about 13 is that it had no towns. And like yep. HD towns are too hard to make. That's no fucking excuse. You know? <laughs> yeah, I remember that. Fuck, it took them a decade or so, but they're back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah Where Enix sure. can make towns again, folks. Yes. Uh-huh. Jesus Christ. Dude, what the fuck happened to towns, man? Sorry, I just got a text about um, Mike is out at, at the the vet with Rush. He's out of, he he's out of town. Ear, he has an ear infection, unfortunately. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, oh no. no. Shit. We're going to have to. Uh, I noticed because I, I was scratching him behind his ear and he yelped. Oh, and we're boy. like, that's strange. Mm. So we got to take care of that boy. All right. What um new addition, the apartment and mm-hmm. Merle. I love her hair. Yeah. Uh, I will. I just love. I will actually. She's probably one of the most intriguing characters to me, and I really like her design a lot. I was and surprised she, kind of she survived. Like, yeah, and and she's kind of like a grandmotherly figure to Tifa. Mm-hmm. Of course. What do we think about her? Sorry, I was like, she's fucking dead. She's she's dying immediately for sympathy, and then she didn't die. I was like, okay, cool. <laughs> she didn't die, dude. No, they she's don't a want fighter, her. man. What what do you think, Brad of Merle? Oh, I loved her, dude. She yeah. was like essentially like threatening Cloud too about her. <laughs> He's like, don't. Don't fuck with Tifa, essentially like that scary cloud. So I really liked her. It was great. And I did love the apartment thing. Just seeing like where characters live, just making it feel more alive. I always appreciate that kind of stuff. Me too. And of course, the uh, their neighbor 
Cloud yeah. almost killing his neighbor and everyone yeah. kind of just shrugging <laughs> yeah. that off. You know, just like, yeah, almost happens. killing him. That's just Cloud. Yeah. The crew does a lot of shrugging off something Cloud does. Yeah, they, <laughs> yeah. Tifa lets him do a lot because she likes him. And speaking of shrugging He's off, good looking, so yeah. speaking of shrugging off, what do we think about why is why is Cloud so unconcerned and uninterested in all three women that are throwing him, themselves at him? <laughs> It's a bit of a frustration. He's, point of frustration he's a, for me. It's he's not a like these are questionable thing. women. You know? Yeah, no. <laughs> Make your choice. Character. I mean, Jesus Christ. You know? He's going through some stuff. That's his character. He's a very awkward and shy character. They talk about that kind of stuff when they're kids and the original and stuff like that. And that's part of his character growth is kind of getting out of that whole thing and tying in his personality to all that kind of stuff. That's Cloud is a goofy, awkward character. That's who he really is when he starts off. He's a 21-year-old guy, too. Yeah. yeah. So frustrating. Well, and, he, yeah. and he's deliberately presenting himself as over everything, right? Like, yeah. he says he's whatever, however cool. many lines in this game. Uh, and so I, it doesn't surprise me that he's trying to stay aloof the entirety of Remake. And he 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 thaws a little bit towards the end. Yeah, he does. He thaws up like with Barrett and all those characters, gets to know them. Is That's there, just part of his character. Brad, is there more clarity? In, I mean, no spoilers, but is there more clarity on which direction he goes in? Yes. In, in, interesting. Mm. Well, I, I, I would actually say no, but, you know, that's I will a, say uh, yes. Yeah, oh, it's, okay. well, well, yes and no, intriguing. but yeah, that, that, that's a huge, huge discussion. So, yeah, let's not have having it not beaten Rebirth, I cannot participate, but I don't Stay want away, you to say anything else. Oh, you haven't played Rebirth yet? Okay, yeah. Oh, I, I've played no. a lot of Rebirth, I have not He's finished not it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Hey, stay away, shippers. We don't want to get involved in that fight. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> we don't care. Well, there's been shippers of Final Fantasy VII since Final Fantasy VII was first well, of announced. Of course, exactly. <laughs> that, that, that's wars why have been. reignited. That's why it, that's why it evokes the old 4chan post about Evangelion and say like, you you dumbasses have been at this for 20 years <laughs> yeah, arguing over back, which 14 dude. year old girl you like better. <laughs> <laughs> I, it, it's always it, it, with the uh, the unbutton Yuffie's unbuttoned pants too or whatever. Mm-hmm. Oh, I love my, that part. <laughs> I, Micah and I are always making fun of anime girls and like I was saying about Grand Blue Fantasy where I'm like she's 8,000 years old like li- uh, Micah literally <laughs> and I'll go into like the bio and I'll be like she's 8,000 see. Um, mm-hmm. I said, she's like, why are her pants on button? I'm like, she's an adult. And then I just like, she's was 16. Like, yeah, I know. And I was joking. And she looked it up and she's like, she's 16 years old. Yeah. I'm like, I know, I know, I know. It's all she's a goofy it. teenager in a style. Yeah, it's strange. I loved, we'll get to her in a little while, but I loved her design and like the, the Moogle. Oh, hat. yeah. It's just so cool. Her Moogle outfit. Oh, it's yeah. great. Good yeah. stuff. The cape is great. Um, mm-hmm. Okay. Let me see here. Um... What do we think? I get we can kind of talk about this now because it happens at multiple times. But one of the one of the notes I had in my on my pink pieces of paper here from the podcast that we did four years ago was pacing. Mm-hmm. And this starts to creep up, I guess, and it creeps up a little bit in chapter three. But there's like three, I guess, major por- portions where it starts to creep up. What do we think about the game structure and pacing? Should it have been a more linear Final Fantasy 13 like, let's say, first 40 hours of Final Fantasy 13 like experience where it is no. beat to beat or should no. they have given you a, a yeah I, i'm kind of in agreement gene so yeah take it away like i guess i i agree that there's a pacing problem in the game but i don't really know what else i would want them to do because you do need to i know they're trying to buy game hours and and pad it i get it mm-hmm. but there is a requirement that you get to know the place for you to really understand and believe it and running through it like it's a corridor like it's a tales game or something i just i don't I don't know. That doesn't right. do it for me. So I don't really know what the solution would have been. I just know that they didn't quite nail it with the pacing. Mm-hmm. I think there are certain sections that you could just carve out. Uh, the, everything around the towns and the whole worlds is fine. Even the side quests are fine, as, as annoying some of them can be. Um, they're fine. Uh, I think there are parts, in particular, the second sewer section, when you have to go back mm-hmm. and then you get mm-hmm. into hook shot. You could just get the hook shot, man. You, they could have just given us a hook shot. I don't know if we needed to chase a rat to find a key under the sewer so we can help this guy out so we can find his dead fiance or whatever. Um, all of that seemed very, very superfluous. It wasn't that long, honestly. Again, again when, when I said I play Remake again and all the friction points I thought were really, really bad back then, they're not as bad now. But there's that. Hojo's laboratory lasts a, just maybe like well, one or two I think, tra- training yeah, rooms if, a little long, you know, right? If they cut off like 10... 
minutes in some of these areas, I think yes. it would have made it a lot more manageable. Yes, just I like, out so, like 10 minutes yeah. of some of these areas, even like the lamps, the sun lamps, yeah, uh, I remember the lamps. when they're, they're going yeah. into reactor. Great sequence. I love seeing the sun lamps. I, I fucking love mm-hmm. the fact that there are sun lamps under the plate and they were turning them off. Awesome. Maybe just let's just turn off two of them or, or, or one of them. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I love areas like where you go through an area and you kind of like figure it out. Like, a, it, you know, it's like the old dungeons, you know, there's like a couple puzzles. You figure out a few routes. That was one of my problems with 16 is it's just kind of very straightforward. That, that those were those were closer to 13 than anything else, quite yeah, to be quite honest, exactly. besides like the open so, areas. Right. I but like yeah, doing like some of these puzzle things, you know, but I think if they just trend some of that off, it would have been a way mm-hmm. smoother experience. Mm-hmm. Where are you and on the page? I, I do want to talk about the hub towns just a bit yeah, because ahead, I think those are very necessary and I agree that you don't want to just run through them. Yeah. But I do think that the side quest design in a game I love mm. could be better. And I mean that from a narrative perspective. Mm. I mean, I prefer it when the side quests are informative of some aspect of the town or the people that when you finish that, you feel like you have a greater understanding of the world or the characters in it. And you don't get that from finding cats for the most part. Mm. You don't get that from some of the side quests here. They seem a little bit check check the box type side quests. I, and I understand this is a huge project, but I, I would love to see a little bit more uh, world building and lore put into those side quests. Yeah, Angel of like, the Sun's part was kind of cool, but yeah, yeah, I like that, that was one. Like one of I the like good ones. The one where you go underground to the lab and fight that behemoth. I thought that was really great building on the lore. Mm. You know, Shinra experimenting on there. But thankfully, they improve in the sequel. So I do. Yeah. Yeah. It seemed very B team, which is often mm-hmm. the case in with side quests, but there are games like uh, the Witcher three stands out to me. Cyberpunk certainly stands out to me where it, it doesn't have, everything can actually have deep meaning. If you just take the time and indicate, right. indicate that it should as, a, as opposed mm-hmm. to making it seem lesser than content, which is why I think mm-hmm. a lot of people are comfortable skipping it over. Um, we brought him up earlier, but Roche. Yeah. So let's talk more about this. The addition of this character, the motorcycle scenes are cool. I like mm-hmm. that you get more control earlier. They're mm-hmm. long. That's another scene that could have had time cut off of it. Exactly. Both, all yeah. those sure. words like, yeah. all right, I get it. Yeah. I get it. It's not that hard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but what do we what do we think about? Uh, let's what do we think about just going up there and seeing the top of the plate, the experience at Jesse's house, the pizza, of course, cloud kind of breaking in. You see the dad sick from m- m- I want to say Mako, Mako poisoning, mm-hmm. and you're kind of just robbing his IDs from him and all that. What do we? What are our <laughs> recollections of this section? There's Roche also, is by, too there's over also the by the way, an important flashback at this point too, where Tifa and Cloud, where you learn more about about that their past. But yeah, uh, whoever wants to take it, please. Oh yeah, ahead, I, I think Roche is too over the top, uh, and I do think he's very modern Square Enix uh, in a way that I don't think gels terribly well with Final Fantasy VII. Every time he shows up in this project, I think in my head. I actually separate from the game and go, why is he added? Why, what is he accomplishing here that they didn't think that they had in the original game? And mm-hmm. I've never come up with a good reason in any time that I've seen him. So he continues to be a big question mark for me. Mm-hmm. Uh, I kind of like Roche. I, he reminds me of a Devil May Cry character. So yeah, I always kind of sure. like that. He's very over the top. Uh, I actually like getting to see more soldier, actual soldier people mm-hmm. in different units. Like you get a couple in when you go to the Shinra HQ in the original game, but getting a more of a taste of like the soldier and like seeing, cause we know, you know, when you get the Genova cells, they kind of screw with you a little bit. So I was kind of wondering like, Oh, is he a little over the top because of these Genova cells? And I was just thinking all that. And I think just having that fun motorcycle sequence with him was definitely an avid children moment where I was like, yeah, I'm into this, but I totally understood when I saw this character, I was like, a lot of people are not going to like this character Mm -hmm. and I totally understand why. Mm -hmm. Well, and to characterize myself again, I I'm, I'm a big fan of final fantasy seven and the games for the most part. I don't love the compilation. I don't love advent children. I don't love. He is absolutely a a, a child of the compilation, like mentality. Absolutely. He is. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. Um, I kind of like that stuff. So that's why I kind of like Roche. Uh, over the years, I've grown to love Roche, but I mm-hmm. definitely was like ambivalent about him at the, at the beginning. I, I had the exact same question you did. That, those are great questions. What is he, what value added, what value added is he adding? And then of course, Brad brings up a great point. We don't really know a lot about the, the soldier class of people other than the, the grunts that we're just killing uh, along the mm-hmm. way. But then obviously they're not soldier first class or anything like that, you know? So yeah. here is another soldier to kind of be, 
uh, uh, Cloud's uh, uh, Virgil, basically. To, to keep That's, I liked that he was a rival, kind of like yeah, a yeah, forced yeah. rival upon Cloud. Cloud like didn't want anything to do exactly. with this yeah. guy. <laughs> I mean, that's the funny thing. Like, like with Dante and Virgil and Devil May Cry, like they, they're brothers, so they know that they got to fight all the time. Yeah. And then Cloud, again, like sticking with Hoag's everybody, everybody wants Cloud thing. It's like like everybody wants to fuck Cloud, and then Roche obviously wants to fuck fight Cloud. You know? Yeah. Um, yep. Because like all the, the whole battle is just a, an allegory for for them just banging each other's brains out, you know, or Roche banging <laughs> bang, Roche banging Cloud to be quite wanting honest. to, yes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's ridiculous. Wanting to blast them. <laughs> That's might, very specific, but yeah. true. It, I just it's so funny that I'm so dumb sometimes that I'm like, oh, I didn't even pick up the old homoerotic, uh, you know, like overtones. And Mike was like, yeah, oh my yeah, god, Colin, like, what is going on? And <laughs> what'd you what'd you say, Gene? I'm sorry. Yeah, exactly. You never pick it up, Colin. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. Um, otherwise, the 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 sequence up on top of the plate with Jesse is is cool. Like you just walk through a basketball court. The streets are very quiet. Yeah. I love the '50s and '60s style motors, suburbs mo- of it, vehicles. Yeah. yeah, the suburbs, right? Like it's it's clean. Yeah, it's cool. It's there is a deep. We'll get into this later when we see more of Shinra, but um, there's this, there's always this deep, there's this, there's this depth of underneath a fascist society or like a corporatist society, whatever this would be, is our nor are truly normal people that mm-hmm. really don't, they probably care, but they're it's like people in North Korea, like they're not stupid. They know like there's there's certain things they can do and can't do. It's not quite as constricted here in Midgar, of course, but or there in Midgar, it's not here. But I just I'm always fascinated by that kind of thing about like the normalcy underneath all of it. You only look at like Nazi Germany. It's like Mm -hmm. it's this thing and you got the SS and you got Mm -hmm. Wehrmacht and all that. But actually, it's just like a ton of people. My favorite stories about North Korea are like like what they play at the nightclubs. (laughs) Like. So they'll be playing like Michael Jackson, like in in the early 2010s, because like Michael Jackson is like new, you know, <laughs> there, you know. <laughs> um, so yeah. So I, I just, all all of, yep. yeah, I, I I'm I, I'm with you, man, because I'm fascinated. I, I I I can never go to North Korea because I'd be so fucked if I go there. Being a journalist and a South Korean, you know. Oh yeah, you um, yeah, they wouldn't. Yeah, yeah, I would not make it out of there. And and, and on weed, you know. I'm yeah, done. You're dead. I'm done. Yeah. <laughs> the, the Washington Post will be having free jean signs all over yeah, the place. Yeah, free jean, free jean. Free jean, yeah. Um, and we learn a little bit about, it's cool. <laughs> Do we know about Jesse being an actress in the original? The, I don't No, recall, I, think that's, actually. I think that's all new. Yeah, I think, I, I think that's I, new. Let me look that up. Look yeah. That. So, Fact check it, Jean. Like that she she grew up with a life of, of relative privilege compared to the rest mm-hmm. of her cell, which is is interesting. And I dig that as well, but she's very down to earth. And I said earlier, and I don't know, if you guys have anything to add about this, but I do love that Tifa and Cloud flashback where they're on the water tower or whatever. Water tower, and yeah. And oh, yeah. Classic. So good. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. really, really emotional and cute. And yeah. Uh, Colin, I want to talk about, just because we're talking about Avalanche, like yeah. uh, Cloud's relationship, or I guess how much more they show Biggs and Wedge and getting to know them. I love that <laughs> uh, Wedge wants to be Cloud's friend so bad. And there's that line when they skydive and he's like, calls him bro. He's like, don't call me bro. Right. I just love all that kind of stuff. And just his heart softening to all these guys later on. It's so good, man. I love that they fleshed all that stuff out. It's wonderful. I think so. I think so too. I like that. They never overtly say like, oh, I'm so sorry. And I love you now. Right. You just see it in the way they react. So that by the end, when they, when they find the, it's like the cats lead them to wedge. Right. And yeah. And all of that, it's like they care. Cloud care. Like you just know intuitively Cloud cares. When there's an when Barrett gets stabbed by Sephiroth, Cloud's like face and demeanor is mm-hmm. awesome because he's mm-hmm. shown almost no softness towards Barrett at all, and mm-hmm. vice versa. And I think he says, like, no, like softly or whatever, or something mm-hmm. like that, which is so cool. So it's just it's read in. Mm-hmm. It's such a wonderful example of what video games can do. Because yeah, and the just, Jesse thing, the Jesse thing is new, by the way. So yeah. Oh, okay, okay, cool. Thank you. Yeah. You just imbibe yeah, yeah. with them because you're just with them. It's it's what it's what makes the experience of playing a game so much different than other. I games. think it's what, what what makes the remake so amazing because we are seeing the Last of Us level facial expressions uh, oh, uh, telling so the story good. to us. You know, it's yeah. it's incredible stuff. You know. Yeah. So good. Like right. anime versions of The Last of Us. Like I think yes. the facial the, the, the facial <laughs> chapters are obviously from very different style, but like they're yeah. just as expressive, I believe, you know. 
we we talked about the sun lamps. I think that's chapter six. I did. I liked that addition too. it. The the scale of Midgar is insane. Like the, mm-hmm. the idea of that there are parachutes. Those are not, as I understand, emergency parachutes. As I understand it, that's how like people like technicians access parts of the plates or parts mm-hmm. of like the uh, like in between in the structures, which is so interesting. So, and the shutting off the the sun lamps, and I guess I wrote these in my notes here would be that. Again, it's the the struggle with Antifa specifically of we're hurting people mm-hmm. like we're, we're we're hurting. So we have to divert the power to get to where we need to go. And in return, we're going to fuck these sun lamps up for the people below and whatever sector they're in. I just love that continued bubbling tension in Tifa that she's totally in over her head. Do we ever. I don't remember if it's in like another piece of of the Final Fantasy seven lore or whatever, if I'm just missing it. But like, what is even her? commitment to barrett she seems so ride or die for him but i don't really know if we ever, at least at this point i'm, I'm at um, where we ever get into like why is she she's the bartender at the bar barrett obviously mm-hmm. d- did they ever have a relationship or are they just friends I like i don't really there's understand a, the book talks about that there's a book talking about that i believe getting into more of that it's on my shelf back there, but I haven't read it all yet, so I can't tell you. Jesus for Christ! Sure. I didn't know there was even. A, I didn't know. There's okay, a, I didn't know there there was a book. fuck ton, Colin, of shit. <laughs> How? Do, so what? What? I understand the Final Fantasy VII universe as being like Final Fantasy VII, Final Fantasy VII remake, Final Fantasy VII rebirth, Crisis Core, Dirge of Cerberus, and the mm-hmm. movie. Mm-hmm. That's it, right? I mean, that's all there's, I would even know. There's some like light novel kind of stuff, like uh, Leslie. I think there's some light novel stuff around him. And there was, um, there was, uh, there was Ever Crisis, which was like that f- mobile the phone game, game, right? With the Turks, and there was Before Crisis, which was like the anime doing the Nibelheim sequence. Oh, yeah, I don't even know any of that stuff. Yeah, according to the wiki, it looks like Tifa, Jesse, and Tifa met first, and they just became friends. Oh, okay. And Jesse, Jesse took Tifa to a, a planetology film. Uh, that talked all about like the planet's health. And oh wow! So they like propagandized her. It's, it's, yeah, she literally got, yeah, in, she got into it. You know? Yeah, <laughs> it's it's super cool. Like it's super, it's cool that they. That is cool. That that, that is kind of how it happens. Like, hey, yeah. come to our, our little DSA meeting or whatever. And right. Like, hey, you know, <laughs> right? That's exactly that's the way it happens. Know? Yeah, fascinating to think to, again, just about the effect on the populace around them and kind of the cavalier nature of Barrett, mm-hmm. but it's so it's so interesting i'd like to know more specifically especially because jesse brings tifa in mm. why is she so loyal to barrett is it so is it because of marlene perhaps probably a part yeah. where she knows mm-hmm. that that's like a requirement for marlene to like live a, a thrive is to have barrett around and so sure. yeah they've just been through some shit together probably yeah mm-hmm. just- yeah because i like that it doesn't it has no sexual overtones, which I like, like none. No, no. You know, it's it's it. And I dig that. I think it it shows it doesn't show restraint because there's already a love triangle, but it were even more than that, really, like a love square. Pentagon. Yeah. 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 <laughs> but no, nonetheless, everyone. Well, yeah, Sephiroth, everyone. Sephiroth, 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 Sephiroth. Even Sephiroth. Yeah. yeah. Red Sephiroth 13. Most. Red yeah. 13. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> All right, let's see where I am. Sorry, I have so many of these fucking. Even Chadley, movies. even Chadley was. Oh, the, the, the Chadley Chadley loves him. oh boy, let's even, talk about even Chadley. Chadley got horny for for Cloud when he saw her in the dr- in, when we saw when he saw him in the dress. That's we should yeah. talk about Walmart. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. True. Walmart. Yeah, or what do you have to say about that, Hoke? Well, Walmart was always a place that I didn't really love in the original, it, just because it's got that vibe. It's the seedy part of town. It's all this stuff that you have to go through to essentially try to free your your girls from being sex slaves. It's not it's not my favorite Final <laughs> Fantasy vibe, uh, but I thought it was well presented in the remake project. And I thought the stuff uh, at it, Honey, it was Honey wild Bee, as a kid to see that shit. Actually, yeah, yeah. I love yeah. that the cedar seedy underbelly dude of this yeah. town. Like we've been through Midgar, we thought it was all fucked up already, but then you just get there and you realize how much more intense it is and seeing this relationship with this piece of shit dawn and all that kind of stuff it's mm-hmm. i really like all that stuff also that madame m chocobo madame m, yeah or madam m chocobo sam and chocobo uh, sam, andrea yeah. andrea rhodes all oh, sex so traffickers good. all sex traffickers that's yep. what they all are yep yep 
It's interesting. All, I never really thought about that. But they too. totally are. Yeah. They all, yeah. They're all, they're so nice. They give you a hand job. They are sex traffickers. They are. <laughs> It's not wrong. Chocobo yeah, Sam. Chocobo Sam Chocobo is like, Sam. so like, where did, like, why does he have to speak like he's from like, ni- you know, 1880 West? You know? <laughs> it's because he is, dude. He sounds like he's in a corner. Like he's a Sammy, a Sammy Elliott character. He's like the guy yeah, from yeah. The, the beginning of the Big Lebowski. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> Fucking Red Dead character. Or whatever he said. <laughs> <laughs> so you guys liked Walmart. Hey, hey you guys, I knew that good sarsaparilla, you know? <laughs> What'd you Did say? Did you like Walmart now? What did you say, Hogan? I'm sorry. Oh, I was yeah. That. I was saying you guys like Walmart in the 90s. Do you, do you like the remakes of Walmart? Yeah, oh, definitely. Yeah. It's I lively. Loved and it. Yeah, I yeah. think it's it it adds a lot. Again, we don't have to make the concessions like I was describing in the SNES Final Fantasy games anymore, where you just assume that there has to be more than this. It's like, this is what it is. Um, mm-hmm. I, it, Dragon Quest XI does that really well, too, actually. It's becoming yeah. just a more of a thing that's happening where it's like there are liter- I, there are people that have done this like articles and videos where you can go around and count the number of people in Final Fantasy 4 and it's like mm-hmm. you know 87 or something you know crazy it's like they, there has to be has to be more than this and so I feel like they now these consoles especially in the 3D space are allowing us to it's that's always going to be a constraint to in the 2D space I think I think that's part of what makes it charming uh, but for the 3D space they're able to really render all these things because even when you're on the plate it's clear that you're not even looking at models below. It's like a it's like a painting, you know, it's which is a very old style, like pre-rendered thing to do. But that's how big it is. They're not even mm-hmm. rendering like the actual buildings or anything because it's it's just too much. It's like it's Tokyo. Mm-hmm. You know, um, there's an obs- I've I've noticed this. I don't want to speak too out of school. It's not like I'm a, an expert on Japanese culture, but there's an there's an there's an obsessiveness with urban living and Tokyo specifically and what that could look like or what could happen to a nation that, you know, a third of its po- Japan's population lives in the city. It's huge. It's bigger than anything anyone can ever imagine in the United States. If you're, if you're looking at our own cities, mm-hmm. I remember when I was there the first time and I was on the top of a hotel and I was looking around, I'm like, it doesn't end in any fucking direction. Mm-hmm. It doesn't end, mm-hmm. you know? Uh, and so I love seeing that kind of ethos play out because Dagan talks about that a lot, how you can see there's a lot of like, there's a lot of Japanese subculture in just the way things are delivered, like their anxieties, their fears, their mm-hmm. hopes and all that kind of stuff, just in the art. And since we consume it so readily as outsiders, we can kind of start to gleam stuff onto it, at least from my perspective. Even when you play the original Resident Evil 2 game uh, and you see Raccoon City is supposed to represent the Midwest and then you walk around the original Resident Evil 2 and it's like, oh, it's a lot of. Japanese looking streets. It, it, yep. They built it look, looking, <laughs> making, making it look like Japan and not at all like Chicago or anything. It's supposed tight to be. streets. Yeah. 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 Small so. little alleyways. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. I really, definitely really agree with that yeah. from a cultural perspective because as a big Final Fantasy fan, one of the things that I have gleaned is that they have a complicated relationship with God and theology. Mm. What like, do we think? I, I don't know how many, I don't know how many Final Fantasies have you killing God or some version of God, but it's mm. a lot. Yeah. Most of them. I would say or some sort of uh, well, even just supernaturalism suggests like a godlike or demigodlike thing. Yeah, like There's definitely a lot of tension there. People say that about um, there are certain things in uh, in early Dragon Quest games, too, that are that they edited out of the early Dragon Warrior games that were mm. uh, on NES that were re- religious, too. And of course, uh, well, anyway, it doesn't matter. It's not going to turn into a Nintendo podcast. OK, <laughs> um, what do we think? of let's talk about like Shinra and uh-huh. Shinra Electric Company. By the way, I got I, I get those custom sweatshirts made sometimes um, and I'm going to get that Shinra logo on a, on a sweatshirt. I think it's, it's a great, great logo. logo. Classic. Yeah, I do so love that the whole goodness. name is Electric Company because it sounds so innocuous. Right. Exa- no, totally. It, no, should I, gonna, should yeah. I get it with the English or with uh, on under or without, you know, how they, you know, you know how they clearly edited some of the logos in, mm-hmm. it looks like maybe to include the, the English text, but then there are some where it's just the Japanese text. It should be. Wow. It should include an electric company. Yeah. The, the fact that it's an electric company that 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 is the imperial force of this nation. I, I always love that. I love it. Yeah, yeah. it's going to be a great it, logo. It Fuck, is. It's I a wonderful Shinra. logo. So what? All right. So what do we think about? Here's the thing. You see this a lot in the, it, when you're talking to people in the trains and all of the rest, and some people around the these slums. There's an the tension of environmentalism in the real world is that plastic is really useful. And electricity makes your life better 
and air conditioning makes your life more tolerable. But they're all bad in some way. And Shinra leverages these identical things in the lives of the people of Midgar and surrounding environs um, to where they are appreciative of it as opposed to being skeptical of it. And they don't really care because there is some level of convenience to having access to it. This is classic. Um, this is like classic authoritarianism in some sense of like giving authoritarianism works when you when, you know, it's like bread and circuses kind of thing. It's like you just worry about these things and don't worry about what we're doing. And they seem to actually have that balance down pretty well. They they control. And I'm not saying it's good. I'm just saying they have a good, they have really good control over. It. They have the news. They have the the whole print apparatus like they shut down that one journalist. Right. Um, and all this other stuff, there's all of these different hints that they are mega powerful, o- overtly and omni, overtly powerful and omnipresent in everyone's lives. But mm-hmm. it doesn't seem like people are really that down on them. And so there's that whole angle of Shinra, of course. And then there are, of course, the characters behind it, whether we're talking about like the executive board and, of course, the Turks. So there's a lot of different threads to, to pull at. I will say one of my earliest fi- um, eBay memories is in 1998. There was a poster of the Turks that I guess was from Japan that someone had brought to the United States and was selling. And I got out, mm-hmm. but I wanted it so bad. Mm-hmm. And um, who knew that, that you still- they would be back in such a glorious way? You know, the so, fact that you still I love remember the that. Turks. Wow. Yeah. It I love the Turks me. because they're both the henchmen and like the comic relief for Shinra. And it's such a wild thing to put together in these characters. And I think the Turks work really well because of it. I, if I have any complaint about the remake project is that I have long kind of wondered exactly how Shinra operates as the nation state that it does. And I had hoped that that would get fleshed out a little bit more. Uh, mm. and, it, and it doesn't really because it, it sits mm. in the place of a government. Right. I mean, like that's what Shinra is. Mm -hmm. Uh, And you don't quite get as much background on that and how it became that. You get the little As museum like. sequence, right? Yeah, you but get the museum it, sequence so. and all that. That's all. But yeah, it's not that detailed, though. You're right. Yeah. 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 Uh, and I love visiting headquarters. I, I love that that's part of Remake. I love that it's part of that first early portion of Midgar in the original. Uh, and I think that's great. And I, I think that some of the stuff that's in there is great. But overall, I still view it as a little bit more superficial than it needed to be. It's It's clearly designed to be corporations can have this role and that's the big shift for final fantasy seven from the kingdoms and nations that were final fantasy six and four and everything before it. Uh, And I think that's fine, like overall, but what Shinra is, how it operates, how it has that power and authority, I just don't think is fully manifested in the world in a way that I would like, but Shinra is a great enemy, right? I mean, Shinra is as good or better than umbrella corp. It's, it's as good as anything in video games. So it's, it's easy Mm -hmm. to hate. And it's easy to uh, to love to hate. Yeah, um, I actually liked a lot of the scenes they added, like in the boardrooms, talking about their plans, and like especially with Reeve, kind of showing his hesitation and everything mm-hmm. they do, and him not gelling with all that's going on. And also, it just the advantages of being an after the fact type of production, right? I always love that when you see like second drafts of things. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you look at this and you go, oh, yeah, you can set up Reeve a lot earlier. Now, you do get weird things like Kate Sith. Showing up at the plate fall, uh, and like that was that, intermission, it, right? Or was that in the original? No, no, no. Game? That was the original it's, game. It's, it's yeah. remake. Yeah, I actually yeah, yeah. asked Naoki, <laughs> that was I actually asked fans. Naoki Hamaguchi about that specific scene. Yeah, about why they decided to put in Kate Sith because there was a lot of people who were surprised Confused. at a, at a cat mm-hmm. appearing and mourning nine eleven at the same time. It is a toy cat that shows um, up in that scene. It's a it's and, not and a vibe. He, and he says. That's funny. That it's funny because I only hear Americans complain about that. In Japan, we just thought, "Oh, what a cute cat," and then they just moved on. We just moved on with our lives. So yeah, it's, funny. It's, it's, it's funny that there that is level. a cultural mindset difference in terms of like you know, like we're we're just not as as acclimated to random mascot characters just appearing in the story for no reason. So we're not as acclimated. No, we're not because it's it's a super serious, sad music, explosions everywhere, and then this cat. Crying to the heavens, and no, you're the, like the, the Ultimania book says fifty thousand people died in the sector mm-hmm. seven, seven plate fall. So that is nine eleven times like what, like ten or something, you know? Yeah, more um, than that. yeah, yeah. Um, I will say about the Turks, uh, it is it it was really it's really really funny to see the struggle of the writing uh, with the Turks uh, because the Turks were later 
retrofitted to be a little bit goofier and funny and handsome and 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 more sympathetic. But in the, in the original, they were the one. They were, they were the ones who pulled the trigger on nine eleven. You know, mm-hmm. and then so in remake, R- Reno is still the guy who pushes the button. But then there's a lot of writing in, 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 before that about him hand wringing about the, the morality of it all. And then mm-hmm. Root says, "Well, it's our job. If if we don't do it, someone else in Shinra do will do, will. So I guess it might as well be us." Yeah, it's weird. Like it's it's a little weird. And it, it didn't. I, I I don't mind it as much, but it, but it, but I can see the struggle that they had in terms of making the Turks these very very popular characters that we all love. I I, I have based a lot of my personal fashion sense on the Turks because they dress like yakuza, <laughs> you know. So I want to I want to dress like yakuza. They they are yakuza in in Final Fantasy Seven. You yeah. Know? I but, think it just gave them a little more humanity. It's fine. Yeah, being, like, I don't mind. I mean, they, they still have to. It's like Sector 77 seven plate has to fall, and they still have to do it. So yeah. it, 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 it was fine. It was just interesting to see that you can tell that, that there was a struggle, and then that's what they landed on, you know? Yeah. yeah there was, I, like, I really like the Turks vibe. Yeah. Oh, yeah, the Turks are incredible. I love They're them. great. Yeah, yeah, I have zero yeah. complaints about them. Yeah, Fucking go ahead, Brad. You were, saying, you were saying something. Oh, no, no. I mean, I guess I was just saying, yeah, because like this whole game is just fleshing out characters, you know, and making them try to make their motives more believable, I guess. So to me, it was just kind of a cool little moment. Just be like, well, they're not complete total pieces of shit. They are, but they at least have some sort of humanity, especially because when you see them later on in further games and like later on in Final Fantasy VII and Avent Children, you know, they are much more trying to be the good guys and stuff exactly. like that. So just exactly. showing like a little, like a little seed of that, just a little bit. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I love um, Palmer, especially that, <laughs> oh, yeah. that, that design, <laughs> but I love yeah. And I got, I, I assume he must be in, in a big, bigger way in the second rebirth or whatever. But if it, no you know, comment. if you have it gleams onto what happens in the original, but I love, there's like that little piece of storytelling. I mean, this is the way I read it. I don't know where it's like, they were, explore they were really eagerly going to go into space and then they realized they didn't have to anymore so they just cut them off basically mm-hmm. and <laughs> and how like all of their vo is like there's like consternation in all of their vo when you press the buttons on the different um kiosks where they don't really want to be doing it and i love mm-hmm. hojo's especially too where uh he's uh basically ex- explaining like it's just too complicated for you to even understand they really did a, yeah. a nice job with the characterizations of both sides of like you yeah, have of the turks kind of the Yakuza like enforcement side. And then of course the executives and we see a lot more of Scarlet in Yuffie's mm-hmm. DLC as well. And she's like the weapons mm-hmm. person riding her Magitek like armor, which is pretty cool. So yeah, I, I dig, I, I always loved them too, Gene. So I could totally relate. Like I was always very attracted to those characters, the music, all of the rest, how they'd appear out of nowhere. They were very cool. And I remember so well that poster cause I wanted it so bad. And I it went to like some obscene amount of money and I just couldn't, couldn't afford it you know i was i think i was literally in ninth grade so long time ago it's when also things on ebay i was thinking about this do you guys remember using ebay when it was uncommon to have pictures of the item like it was Mm. it was almost unheard of to have pictures of anything you were buying that was that was what was so interesting about ebay until that you know the late 90s Yeah, that's dicey it's it's how i used to buy baseball cards it was always a hope and a prayer right yeah i bought (laughs) gi joe's like that too oh god i wish i bought everything i found back in the day because everything was so cheap Mm -hmm. it's not like that anymore no. Can, okay. can I say something about the boardroom meetings too? Oh, yeah, please, please take. Oh it yeah, on. yeah. Go ahead. My favorite part is when Hojo is suggesting to the the, the board Shinra that he might have to breed Aerith by using mm-hmm. red, and then you see the faces of like Heidegger and Scarlet. And like Rufus, like, like, everybody on the table, they're like, "Oh, what the fuck, yeah. dude? Like, who, yeah. you gotta work with this motherfucker, <laughs> Jesus!" Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's so freak. hilarious. Like, as horrible as the entire company is. Hojo is just like the fucking worst of them all. Yeah, top level freak in that whole organization. <laughs> I love that the scene. Whole, oh, the sorry, whole but... Final Fantasy VII issue is because of him, anyways, right? Yeah, so. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, it is. I mean, he's like the he's like the Doctor Wily esque mad scientist. Way worse, obviously, in, in, in most ways. Although Doctor Wily is kind of like a genocidal maniac, so I don't. We don't have to. We can leave that for another time uh, in another place but <laughs> Mega Man lore. But yeah we, we won't we won't loop in the Mega Man lore here but I do the the science stuff like the out of control run amok science stuff alongside the philosophical it's like yin and yang you have like the philosophical right. religious like mana and all of this kind of stuff and then you have the the complete exploitation of all things science on the other hand and marrying them together 
See, that's what Final Fantasy VI really wasn't. Final Fantasy VI was just about power, like not electric power, mm. but just sheer power and how you can exploit it. This was like this is a modern take on that by saying like actually we can we can structure our entire society around this power that we can also bastardize in all of these amazing ways. So mm. I dig it. I mean, it, it's a uh, it's cool I, and. Having a comp- a corporate government, basically, like that you never hear the government. Uh, you you see Mayor Domino, who is like a a puppet, literally a mm-hmm. puppet, mm. in inside their library and doing paperwork, and they just keep him busy doing all this nonsense. It's so, it's inside out, and it's kind of cool because usually the structure would be like the business would be nestled inside the government and doing its secret work, but really, the the, the tail's wagging the dog, I guess, in some way. All right, what else do I have here in these notes? So many different things. Oh, yeah. Again, by chapter seven, you're supposed to not know this yet because you wouldn't have played the Yuffie DLC. But you you see again that they're lying about or like that. It's funny, like they are setting this all up. Shinra setting everything up, including Avalanche's collaboration with Wu Tai. And the idea that that's not true is just totally wrong, which I just love. That's like one of my favorite features of the story. All right. What do we think about, I love the scene here, Aerith's, when you don't hear it, but she mouths Zach when she's talking right. about her first boyfriend. Oh, it's so good. Yeah, it is good. I don't think I even caught it the first time. It gets the trauma. Uh, yeah, I don't think I caught it the first time either. Yeah. Some of those are very kind of Alan Wake, Mr. Scratch type, mm-hmm. uh, type looks. They just have Cloud have a psychotic break whenever something like that is being said. And I, I really like that effect, mm-hmm. which is from the original, but it's well done here. Yeah, there is a lot of Alan Wake in here. Yeah, dude, when um, yeah, go ahead, bro. he gets like the vision the first time of the materia dropping or whatever, and he like sheds a tear, man, I lost my shit at that. Oh, I was man. like, holy fuck. <laughs> well, talk about why game. you want to play the first one, right? It's yeah, like they exactly. have that. They have holy look. falls so many times mm-hmm. in this game. All right. And like I'm playing it with my daughter, right? Who oh. hasn't played the original. How old is she? And like every every time they do it, she's 14. 14. She was uh not 14 when this game came out right. so she was she was 10 uh but she loved it she loves Aerith. uh she loves all these characters she loves this story and i've been holding on to this uh you know Aerith situation for a long time <laughs> uh and uh they have they have holy fall so many times to signify what can change and what can't change in fate uh, and the tear is one of those and Aerith's speech at the end is one of those. And I love that they're playing with that because I remember back in the nineties being on forums and people having notions of the 17 different things you could do to save Aerith. Oh or my bring God. Her back. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Right. Like that was one of the big things, uh, is, uh, trying to get Aerith back. It was general and- Leo on steroids, basically from <laughs> final fantasy six, where people were like, you can get general Leo in your party. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But you can't. Go on. I didn't mean to interrupt you, Pogue. I'm sorry. Oh, not at all. Uh, and, and so I think it's really cool that they're doing those kinds of things in this game. Uh, but I have to stop talking because everything else I would say would be related to Reaper. Yeah, fair enough. Thank you. <laughs> we talked about Elmira. We talked about Sector 5 mm-hmm. slums a little bit. Anything left to say about Aerith or... Um, you know, it, there there is that... Elmira, we we learn why Elmira is so protective of Aerith, but I hate that. I mean, I hate it as a viewer. It's tough. Like when she basically tells Cloud, like, you got to go. And that Cloud yeah. basically accepts it. It's kind of strange how quickly that that very traumatic things undone by Aerith simply popping out of the alleyway and being like, I'm going to follow you and all this kind of shit. She's just like, nah. Yeah, it just it happens. There are a few there are emotional beats in the game that happen that are resolved too quickly. Mm, and sure. for a game like that takes death. Right, Barrett. Yeah, exa- that's exactly what I was gonna say. Barrett's death is a great one. It's like, why wouldn't you let that just go for even one beat? Like, why are you undoing it already? Because I remember playing it. I was like, holy shit, you know, like <laughs> what? Like what? Yeah, like <laughs> I, I could, and I was like, I, I can't. I mean, from my perspective, I'm like, what would have looked like if you that was like, no, that that's like where the whispers like they they lose control of the situation or whatever. But obviously, it kind of it's bumped out just a little bit. But it's like, mm-hmm. damn, that would have been a bold, almost like uh, Game of Thrones season one or book one 
uh, right. move where it's like, no. I don't know what I would do if Barrett is actually dead. Yeah, yeah that, that would be a disaster. Yeah. In I, my I, opinion. I, I, I actually can't. It's it's funny that, that I guess it is funny that it got resolved so quickly because I can't envision the, any, the rest of the story without Barrett. It's it's impossible. It's crazy. Yeah. Well, <laughs> the whispers were close by already because of Sephiroth. Yeah, exactly. And they were like... <laughs> Yep, <laughs> Uncharted does a similar thing with one of their characters, and they let that it, one was for you, Locke. By the way, and they, so. <laughs> and they let it go for longer, let it marinate, let the emotion get like, is it real or is it not? Yeah, they, the Barrett death is a great example. That's exactly what I was going to say, Gene. Um, all right, let's see here. Oh, so <laughs> the Chocobo stables and all this. We talked about Wall Market. We talked about the massage mm-hmm. parlor. Oh, Coliseum fight. So. Burke, Beck, and Butch, and the Scotch and Koch hosts, or whatever. These are such fucking yeah. weird, <laughs> weird. The Hell House fight, dude. Yeah, that Literally was cool how they did the house. That's cool how they kind of got that in. Because mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. is one of the more just fighting the house, like in the random encounters in Midgar or whatever. It was so weird, even as a kid. I was like, what the hell is this enemy? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then mm-hmm. they kind of lean into it, which is cool. So I dig that. We have Corneo's audition. audition really interesting rendition of Corneo I think very creepy very yep. annoying how they walk back into the room and get dropped into the sewer like they're so dumb sometimes just like yeah. get out of there what the fuck are you doing All this, seven <laughs> is a goofy game and very serious game at the same time right it's yeah. like Yakuza that's true it is it's got that melancholy yeah uh from time to time and I think that the scene that they do where they actually threatened on Corneo is as literal as I can think of for what happens in the original, at least in my memory. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I really do appreciate when they do that kind of thing. Uh, the scene at yeah, the Honey Bee Inn. Great. Yeah. That's good Handled stuff. that really good. Yeah. They did my favorite line I really anyway. like that. I really like that mechanic of essentially following the, the, the icon through the actual rendered movie. Uh, and having to track it in order to get your rhythm right. I, mm. I think that's a really well done mm-hmm. mini game. And my favorite line in the game, besides the Steel Sky line, is when Tifa realizes it's Cloud. And Cloud is like, nailed it. I know. Got it. Moving on. Yeah. <laughs> that, that, that is one of the funniest lines I've ever heard in a video game ever. Yeah. It's, it's amazing. Uh, Tifa's voice acting is great. And I, Aaron, I, love, I love almost all the voice acting from all of these folks. The only one that gives me pause at all is Aerith. And that's hmm. not because I think that she's a bad voice actor. It just does not match up to the level of sassiness uh, that I had read into Aerith's character uh, from the original game. She was sassy. So she plays, she plays a much more kind of aloof Luna love good Disney princess with a little sass. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it, it just is a different take on the character than I originally had. So that's more my fault than hers. Uh, but that's the only one that just doesn't gel with me perfectly. There's, there, there, there's a interesting thing with her voice direction. Brianna White's amazing and she does an amazing job, right? But with the voice direction, a lot of it is that she is, uh, she does have a lot of up talk. So a lot of the, her sentences are kind of ending like this, you know, mm-hmm. and which which is not a problem because it makes the times when she does speak a lot more declaratively, like the speech at the end of the freeway, right? Where she says, you're wrong. And she doesn't say, you're wrong, you know? She says, you're wrong. It makes those moments a little, a little bit more powerful to me. So that's why I like her performance a lot. Yeah, that's interesting because she says something about Sephiroth at the end too, right? Like, mm-hmm. Yeah. Which mm-hmm. is like, I don't like anything about this. Like, there, nothing's right about this man or something yeah, like that. Yeah, nothing's right about it's this. Like it's, and, and it doesn't sound like a question at all. Right. She's say, saying it declaratively. It's you know? a really great line. Or Yeah, it's great. Yeah. she. I would I would actually agree with you in that. In the core cast, she's probably the the weakest maybe, but it's all very strong to me. Like, I, 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 mm-hmm. I'm trying to think of like a, a game recently where I can think of a TV show. There's a TV show Turn. Did you guys watch that show? It's about the sp- yes, spiraling a lot of it. during the revolution. Yeah. The dad mm-hmm. of the main character is so bad that, in my <laughs> opinion, that it like drags every scene that he's in down. I don't get anything like that in this at all. No, no not at all. Yeah. And, and again, I think it's really more just kind of the juxtaposition between how I think Aerith should sound and then when yeah. she says something. She is very I, Disney I, princess here for sure. She's absolutely Disney princess. I, I think that's by intention. They, 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 you're yeah. meant to be to have Aerith really pushed on you. You know, please like this girl. <laughs> we, we know, we know what Tifa looks like. Please like this other girl too. Yeah, you know? it's please like, give her a chance. Yeah, I, I wonder. I mean, it's the pick of the litter, my friend. All right, <laughs> exactly. Director Tuesty 
Is this a new character? I don't remember this character. Um, let me see. Yeah. Um, Wait, like, I don't, God, I don't even remember in, in remake now. Jesus. They don't really go oh, back yeah. to him too much. But I, I, I had that question. I should probably should have resolved that before we started. Recording. Oh, Reeve? Oh, that's Reeve. Oh, that's the same character. Yeah, that's Reeve. Oh, okay. yeah, I, like, they that's call Reeve. Him, I have in my notes here, Director Tuesti. I think someone calls him that. And I don't realize yeah, it's the same that's, character. Yeah, okay. that's his yeah. Like, okay. last name. Well, that answers oh, that God, question. Yeah. We, we totally forgot what Reeve was. I was like, is. holy we shit. We, talk, we, so we already talked about Reeve. Not we already talked about Reeve. That makes sense because I wrote that he has a conscience about a conscience about Sector 7 getting destroyed. It's actually kind of sad to see him like going and like in earnest dispatching his team to make plans for them just to get mm-hmm. ev- again it is like the comic book evil stuff that happens where they're all, it's almost so normal it's hysterical too when people are in the elevators with you and they don't really know that one guy gets on and he's just on his phone doesn't realize that this yeah. huge, the guy with a huge sword is behind him and and all the rest and then they it play is on funny that to with- see cloud walking around with that sword or Barrett well, with his gun arm oh yeah i was gonna say cloud makes some more sense to me because he's soldier and soldier was in that building all the time like that's, that's where true. they would hang out in crisis court and stuff like that. That's true. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. But yeah, Barrett. Yeah, with a machine gun arm. I don't know. It's a weird universe, I guess. It is a weird universe. No, it's funny because you just accept it as your anime party. Yeah. And then you realize how unusual Barrett still is, even in this universe with his gun arm. Yeah. No, Barrett. The, what, what kind of human is that big? What the fuck? You He's know? a humongous <laughs> unit. He's also He's the huge. only <laughs> black person. In, uh, in, in remake, in remake, in the in first remake? one, like there's not really there's some there's some in Sector Five and stuff like that. I remember. really like it's like I don't yeah I felt like he was like the only or one of the very few. I'm not saying like from a representational standpoint. I'm curious about like sure where does he come from? Why is it's almost like a suggestion? You know, like in get well, you brought up Game of Thrones earlier when you meet the. Do you guys watch that or read that or whatever? I did. The, yeah. the mm-hmm. um, when you meet the pirate characters, mm-hmm. they're black. Like he's black, and it seems like he comes from a place where that is like the thing in that world. And it was mm-hmm. almost like they're so seldom seen or not seen at all. It's almost like where does Barrett come from? Is it supposed to be like a different place? Because this is not Earth, fair. you know. By mm-hmm. the way, I had this long. This is a Final Fantasy sixteen theory, but I had this theory that Final Fantasy sixteen. Take, takes place in the same pl- place as Final Fantasy 4. And I said that when the okay. game came out. Did you see mm-hmm. that the new DLCs where it takes place? I don't no, know. Yeah, they, that's right. That's right. Mer- Meridia. Uh, yeah. Missidia. Missidia. Oh, Missidia. I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. The, uh, yeah. the, the, where Porum and Palom are from. Mm-hmm. In, mm-hmm. Well, mm-hmm. Colin, they, uh, but that might be in 14. Fantasy, there's a lot of Final Fantasy 4 stuff in 14. Yeah. So maybe that I was going to say, I know that too. People, I, I heard that that was by intent. Like they, they look at that game as kind of a North star, but I could have maybe, yeah. maybe yeah, yeah, yeah. smart, no, totally, yeah. smart yeah. people. We're they put a lot of stuff from all the games in 14, don't they? Yeah, we're missing out yeah. like, yeah, of course. Triad yeah. over yeah. there. I don't know. I if finished Vanilla, but that's, that's all I finished. So yeah, I can't get into Final Fantasy 14. It's just like a, that's a job. I don't have time for that. Yeah. You don't like MMOs, Colin. You just don't. No, I, I don't, don't think you would like in the gameplay, you wouldn't like. I don't think. So. No, I don't. Th- I don't. Think for so. you. I, well, I actually was like starting to open my mind to it, and then I watched the gameplay, and I'm like, no, this is no. Oh, no it's no. it's 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 so hard to get into. It's crazy. I'm glad that people like it. I'm not talking shit about it. It's just I it love it. even like the armor system and the upgrades and everything. That, that it, it's it's very uh it's very labyrinthian, you know. So we had brought up earlier. We're, I'm going through my notes quicker now because we've talked about so many things, and, and I'm sorry, I'm reading as I'm going, so I'm, I don't mean to be rude. Um, we talked about the Kate Sith cameo we talked mm-hmm. about on i think it was at the live show or on the last episode of the show of sacred symbols proper but how to say kate sith because yes, i always yeah. said it kate sith and then there was this rumor for many years that you, it was like some more Catchy. like Gaelic kind of thing yeah yes and then but then i think they reaffirmed that it's kate sith it's Kate mm-hmm. Sith. Because they it's must Kate say Sith it now. in the game, in the new game, right? In so, the original Kate Japanese Sith. game, it was pronounced Kitshi, like like the Gaelic uh, uh, phrase. Right. So that's yeah. why, you know, you would have elitist uh, uh, correcting Maximilian dude say, actually, it's Kitshi. Yeah, fair enough. Um, but, that's, that's, but he didn't, he didn't yeah. know any about anything about any of that. And then Square Enix says, fuck it. It looks like Kate Sith, so we're calling him Kate Sith. So yeah. why not? So what do we think about is. that appearance? Do we know that Kate Sith witnessed the destruction? Not in, not in the original. Right, no. in the original. So that's new. Like, I wonder no. why they... What was you know, that? I think I think for me that scene is just worse in, in 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 this in this version because if you watch the OG version, it has no music, and then there's a newscast going on, and then you see the anchor like look up and then get crushed on live TV, 
and there's no music at all. And then it, it pans to President Shinra looking down. You don't see his face, and then you hear yeah. the opera music, and then, yeah, and then yeah, everything yeah. burning. That's a great you know? scene. Yeah. Absolutely. To me, that 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 they they, they kind of and then, and in in the remake version, you know, obviously case sets or whatever like that. But then it, it, the whole time there's Japanese rock just wailing. It's fucking guitar riffs <laughs> <like, laughs> right until the end, and, and it's just like oh man, they kind of ruined that scene. But whatever. I, that, to me, that's just the worst part of the episode remake. It was like those those fifteen seconds. So. Interesting. <laughs> yeah, I, I definitely that scene was probably the most confusing thing for people that didn't play the original. Yeah. Of course, because yeah. if you played it, you you know who, immediately who that is, and you're like, oh shit, maybe yeah. you're going to encounter this character a little earlier too. I mean, that's I remember playing it the first time and being like, well, everything else is all fucked up now, so why wouldn't this character just randomly appear? Sure. Sure. Um, but yeah, my, for- my my theory is that we're gonna find out that Reeve was piloting the the, the case Seth robot to try to stop the Sector Seven plate. And he was just too late, and then he saw yeah, what yeah. happened. And That's it's what like, I oh, think oh so fuck, too. you know, because then Reeve can't just go there himself and and just do it because he's undercover, right? So yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Spoilers for OGF. Yeah, so that's I yeah. I, I, that's I was gonna say, is that a spoiler? Because that's it's a. We assume you know Final Fantasy VII, right? So I think that's okay. Yeah, yeah. I'll make a note of it in the uh, in the description though. Yeah, you shouldn't be playing this without having played Final Fantasy VII. I don't know how many other times you need to be told <laughs> that. You shouldn't be even listening to this. Colin like yelled yeah. at you guys. I know. Yeah, you did. Give me a break. Don't listen to me for once. All right. We talked about Elmira and Aerith. Mm-hmm. Let's see. Oh, Kiri or Kyrie? Kyrie. 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 Fucking book character. She's a book the, character. Like a propaganda. Yeah. What, what, so what is this? Who she's from the books. Okay, yeah, yeah. I don't know her. I don't I don't yeah. remember her. Okay. She was not in the original, I believe. Yeah, I don't think no, so. Not at all. Not at all. She's another yeah. goofball add-on, but she's a, she's, I like her she's a, she's a compilation theme. add-on for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So there's that. I like her relationship with her grandma and stuff like that. The angel, that the slums, cute. and stuff. Yeah. And I like Johnny too. Johnny was like, oh yeah, Johnny. extremely brief in the original game, but they like flushed him out and made him goofy. I love when he's running around Wall Market with you, trying to get make the dress and everything. It's great. In the mm-hmm. Yuffie DLC, you meet him again. And yeah, I I could be wrong, but I, I was like, that's not I don't think that's Yuri Lowenthal doing the voice on the piece. Yeah, he's the voice of him. Yeah. In the DLC as well. Oh, in the DLC. I don't know. I assume oh it God. is. It sounded like I was like, Mike, what do you think? I was like, it sounds like an impression of him, you know, but I don't know for <laughs> sure. Because, you know, sometimes people aren't able to. Yeah, sure. Come and do, you know, just a few more lines or whatever. Someone of that stature. But who knows? All right. We were talking about Shinra HQ. What do we think about it in? this rendition i got real i don't know if this is like really accurate but i kind of got like parasite eve vibes like this is what sure this is what this could look like Mm -hmm. in in modernity even even control gives you a little bit of that like in the the the, uh, remedy game but yeah this this in a major way the the kind of industrial it's not industrial corporate glass and i don't know just beautiful tile work and yeah it's fancy yeah uh, yeah it's a great capstone to the game i think the visit to hq you get the you get a lot of the lore dumping and exposition you get a really cool new environment that's not like anything you ever played before in the game uh and yeah i I really love it i am a little bit kind of ambivalent about the change in the blood trail to a genova trail uh but i think that overall the headquarters sequence is one of my favorites in the game yeah, that's like a rating things a ratings thing to me. <laughs> I don't know. What I do don't you know mean, why. I wish it was normal blood. Well, oh. because it might have had been like rated. Oh, M I or see what you mean. I understand what you're saying. Rate right, right. Blood, mm-hmm. actual blood. But yeah, the original that's, was cooler with that. That definitely. sucks. Yeah, but I guess it would have been a hallway full of blood. Then I guess yeah. right, which, yeah. which would have been sick, man. Fucking shit. Yeah, it would have been sick. All right. So yeah, I like the. You learn uh, it is an exposition exposition dump because I'm looking some of my pap- some of my papers are uh, just a few like a few lines for a chapter and this is a whole page for this chapter so I know that there was a mm-hmm. lot of of dumping here I think this is when we discover like the museum and stuff that we were talking about earlier yeah, uh, um, yeah, yeah. but we meet Mayor Domino and Hart here as well and we see we learn the extent of Shinra's spying at this point it's interesting because again I don't know how that wasn't so obvious to them the entire time but we learn that through i guess various shinner scientific projects that they are en route to this other land where uh this promised land i guess they call it where the ancients 
I guess once lived, Aerith is Cetra, the, yeah. Cetra, right. Aerith is like the last of them. Mm-hmm. And so I don't know. I what do we think about this whole this whole culmination of the story at Shinra HQ? Uh, uh whoever wants to take it is fine. Go ahead, the bro. whole story? Well, I I liked at the beginning they had the elevator and the stairs at least still letting you choose that. That was super great. I was very happy mm-hmm. they included that. Mm-hmm. Um, I thought Shinra HQ was great. I loved all of it except like Gene brought up earlier, the Hojo lab part drags too long. I like the idea of switching between characters. I always think that's really fun, but yeah, it's a mm-hmm. little too long. And of course, I love the rooftop fight with Rufus up there. I love that's that a, fight. That's a tough fight. Uh, that's when he has his it makes dog, you, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It like makes you reload. Yeah, it's like, oh shit, I gotta really think about like, the counter thing, and you gotta hit him with the reload. It's a really different fight throughout the rest of the game, so I really love that. Mm-hmm. I think yeah, I played it. Really it feels like a very precise, almost from soft type boss battle. Sure, yeah. Mm-hmm. I played the game so brute force in some way that, like, never block or do anything like that. Just like, mm-hmm. r- like hit and roll, and then cast magic or use my abilities. And I wonder if I tried to play the hard mode or whatever. I was like, I probably would really have to seriously adjust the way I play because you do, yeah. Because I, mm-hmm. and I, I don't even know if that would be fun for me at that point. I like the more action oriented. Like final, some people thought Final Fantasy 16 was too easy, but I was like, and it was easy, but it was, <laughs> but, but it was fun. You know, I, I still yeah, felt the combat was fun. when I was playing it. Um, I like Cloud rec- being recognized by his old training buddies. Oh, Kun, cool. he, dude, he says, let me get console or something like that. That's like Zach's buddy or whatever in Crisis mm-hmm. Core that like emails Zach all the time. Oh I shit! Same guy, I think that's the same guy. No, you're right. I totally missed it. Wow. Yeah, it's super cool, and uh, I do like the just Tifa like getting the card in the beginning. I think is a kind of a cool platforming section. You kind of have to automatically fail it. You don't really realize oh, it at yeah. the time when you fall down. You feel like you did something mm-hmm. wrong, but it's mm-hmm. necessary for you to get down in this other path. I already mentioned Mayor Domino and and Heart. I, let me ask you this. I wrote this in, in my notes. This is an important question. I wanted to get into a philosophical question with you guys. Can the people who work for Shinra be absolved of, of their participation in this? This goes into, I was reading recently, this kind of revision to history. There, there's this idea after World War II that of the clean Wehrmacht. I don't know if you guys know that, that term, where it means the Wehrmacht is the Nazi army. And there's this idea that they were basically not political. And they call that the clean Wehrmacht, where they were just kind of doing their business and it was the people above them and the commanders and all that and the Nazi party itself. And then there's this other theory that, no, like you're very much complicit if you participated in this and you know a lot more than you are saying and you're making it seem mm. as you're, that you're as innocent as possible. As you walk around Shinra HQ, you encounter a bunch of people. You can't even go into all the rooms. There's that really cool scene where you're down a corridor and there's these control rooms where you, you can't even get into them and everyone's at these desks. They look like NASA control rooms almost. And it was really mm-hmm. cool because I, I appreciated the, the, uh, the production value because I was just watching them and there's all these unique animations of people doing all these different things in there. And it shows the hullabaloo about everything. And in addition to the random people you encounter in elevators or on the corridors or whatever. And it made me think like Shinra, it, the, the game does a really nice job in its modernity of showing Shinra for the size and scope of what it is. And I was wondering how do these people feel about their participation? How much do they know about the bad things they're doing? How can they oh. not know at a certain level what's going on? Um, for instance, I mean, there are soldiers in the room when they're having, like when, when the board is having their meetings, there are soldiers there. You would imagine those soldiers yeah. that tell people, these guys are fucking insane. You mm-hmm. know, um, <laughs> it's just strange for you. Do you have any thoughts on that, Brad? Oh, I was just going to oh, say, okay, yeah, I think ahead. a lot of people don't know exactly what's going on you know they're told lies or whatever by the corporation just like so many people believe all the lies that Shinra's telling they're like you see a lot of them scrambling working on computers because the plate just fell so they're trying to deal with all that kind of stuff like that but of course there's going to be people who are, compl- who are okay with bad things happening like the soldiers or they don't really have a choice it, maybe it's death if they d- decide to tell anyone or something like that so they're so i'm sure a lot of people are terrified in there but there's definitely evil people in that corporation, no doubt. Any additions to this before we move on? Well, these are the these are the great kind of political science ethics questions of all of these kinds of issues, right? This is what great storytelling can do. 
is uh, is all of Shinra complicit? If you're just running the electrical operations board, do you have an ethical obligation to quit your job immediately when Shinra is dropping plates on people? I mean, we'd love to say yes, right? Just like we'd love to say yes in other institutions in real life. Uh, but to some extent, that's not... That's not fair or functional for these huge organizations that do all these various things. So mm -hmm. do I think everyone at Shinra is complicit? Probably not. There's probably a line somewhere that you could draw mm -hmm. uh, between the board and the janitorial staff at Shinra headquarters. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's, it's a hard one to draw. And it's part of the fun conversation of a story and narrative like this one, right? Is Avalanche okay? I mean, they bomb a reactor and kill a bunch of people in Sector 1 or yeah. Sector 8 or whichever direction that went. Uh, and is that okay? Well, maybe it is okay because the live stream is very real and we learn that at the end of the game and, we're, and, and Shinra is really that bad. But we don't know that when we blow up that reactor. We haven't gotten mm -hmm. any of that background yet. So is that ethically okay before we know that? Mm. Those are fun conversations mm -hmm. to have, and this is what great storytelling can do. This is a fun conversation, too, because it reminds me of Cyberpunk 2077, uh, when Johnny Silverhand nukes <laughs> the, 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 the equivalent of Shinra Corporation in that game. And then, Our you know, son. people accuse him, like, you killed my, my husband was in that, that fucking nuclear explosion. Yeah. And then Johnny Silverhand would say, it was not supposed to be like this or whatever. So, like, he actually, like, even an, ex an extremist, like, Keanu Reeves, Johnny Silverhand, was, he didn't, he did not mean to target, even though he did, but he did not mean to target uh, people who n are not as complicit. Uh, he he right. even understood that line between, you know, the board and the janitorial staff, basically, you know. We have this. And the world oh, really is dying. Yep. Yeah. No, I, I was I was just reiterating that the the world really is dying, right? And and Shinra doesn't care, and, and it's going to take some massive action to save it. So I, I mean, our our heroes are heroes at the end of the day, but they're taking some steps and making some choices that we would not call heroic mm -hmm. usually. Mm -hmm. In in pursuit of this neo Midgar uh, that they want to build, we meet Red Thirteen. What do we think about? him in this game i love the voice acting it's yeah very much great. the way i imagined it to sound or him to sound excellent yeah mm -hmm. yeah what do yeah, we think about awesome. 13 here brad i love him i it's so great to see him i love the moment where he's like he breaks out a thing and he's very like uh feral i guess very mm -hmm. aggressive then Aerith touches him on the head and he like instantly understands everything and calms down immediately i love that and i love Disney that princess just, like, yeah <laughs> and um I love his connection with Barrett. They have good chemistry together, really good humor together. I love that. He asks, I think, Red 13 to smile at one point. Mm. And he does. Yeah. He's like, yeah, yeah, maybe you shouldn't do that. Yeah. And Red 13 like hits him with his tail at one part. Oh, yeah. They're so yeah, good yeah. together. Yeah. They rule. Yeah, I like Red 13. He reminds me of Beast from the X-Men cartoons. Like that's mm. that's his his vocal read is very much like this mm. yeah. old wise animal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good pull. I agree with you there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like it. I like him here too. I mean, so what is Ho? How does Hojo? I guess I'm kind of lost on this. Is like, how does Hojo gleam so much power internally? He seems to have extraordinary amounts of power to do whatever he wants. Compared, I guess oh, it's because, because he's the scientist. Yeah, yeah. All the soldier, all their power, and everything like that is a lot because of him. Yeah, that makes sense. You know, like one, Sephiroth. One thing I would add is that Shinra is very powerful and is doing a lot of things. They are not what I would call very functional at a board or management level. There's a lot of dysfunction and a lot of infighting uh, at those levels. And you see Hojo kind of consolidate his power around research and development, mm. which is what the story we're being told in Final Fantasy VII is really focused around. So he mm. appears to have a lot of power to us. Uh, I don't know that research and development is actually running things at Shinra, but it is when it's opposed to Avalanche in our group. Yeah, it's interesting that there's a perfect shot of Hojo when he goes up to elevator after he leaves the party with like monsters or whatever, and he just mm -hmm. looks back at the camera and he has this huge shit eating grin. Yeah. And I'm like, that is Hojo. I want to beat the shit out of you, but that yeah. is a fucking perfect rendition of Hojo. I could not believe how how, how much they nailed Hojo. Yeah, Jesus they nailed Christ. everybody, dude. Yeah, every character like acts exactly how they should, pretty much in yeah, my mind. I, could, I couldn't much. believe it. I couldn't believe it. I love the uh, the shot when Red Thirteen almost gets to Hojo, and Hojo just turns around but doesn't react at all, like no reaction, and gets captured mm -hmm. by mm -hmm. the machine or whatever. It's just a really cool, cool shot. No fear, 
at all. Oh yeah, my but, favorite part is when Hojo was about to say a spoiler and all the fucking whispers just fucking like rip him out of the yeah. room. <laughs> <laughs> so funny, dude. It's like a moderator banning someone. <laughs> <laughs> fucking Discord mod. Yeah. We, with Discord's mods of faith. <laughs> Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> you do have fun with what you know. Yeah. It's cool the uh, cloud starting to see black feathers as well. I mm-hmm. think he sees the first mm-hmm. one as yep. the elevator closes in chapter mm-hmm. 17, which is pretty cool. I did not notice that until the, the, the second remake, but I was like, oh, that, that is a late Black Feather. I thought, that, I thought the Black Feathers were falling up throughout the remake, but it's like, no, that's, that was the first one. Mm-hmm. That's, some, that's some restraint. So despite the fact that Starfall does seem to show up a lot in the game, but then the, the Feather shows up, it's like, okay, well, you know, they're, they're ramping it up, you know, obviously. Mm-hmm. So I like it. <laughs> one thing I wrote in my notes that I thought was, <laughs> was frustrating, again, just plot frustrations is, why do they let President Shinra run back inside to this office and to the desk? Like, why didn't they just restrain him? I don't understand. I don't like, what, what? And then he was like going through things, and Barrett's just standing there like a moron. It's like, what do you think he's doing? I don't know. It's just so strange. That was like so. Sh- that was truly strange. Like, what yeah, is up I with got this? No answer for that. That is just some writing. I again, writing the writing requires some of these characters to be dumb as fuck. I think you know, it's just too bad. It's just too bad. It's very funny. I don't think that whole sequence comes together super well. I, I, I like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right. I like the, I like that Barry gets to have a word with President Shira before he gets fucking ganked. But like, it was really, really awkward, awkward scene for sure. Yeah, they wanted they, Barrett to die and be revived, and I don't know why exactly, but they wanted it, and so they, they moved w- things around. They wanted to show you that the, just the whispers are protecting the timeline or the fate kind of thing. I like, guess, yeah, it was. They're a, not allowing but, things to change. That was like their whole function, and that was a clear sign of that. Yeah, that was the strongest way to to, to kind of demonstrate that. Yeah. I guess. I guess. Yeah. So. This red uh, red thirteen says this death is not the one ordained to you by fate. Mm-hmm. So yep. Um, I just don't want the ghosts to be able to revive a dead body. It's 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 too far. <laughs> it was a lot. I was like, okay, guys, all right. <laughs> Let's see what else we talked about. Rufus and, Rufus and Dark Star. That is a cool fight. Dog name. Yeah, cool. It's definitely a cool dog name. You got to name it. You got it. You got to get like a poodle and name it Dark Star. You know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Also, I'm not gay, and I don't want to be gay, and I'm glad Rufus Shinra isn't real. Oh, okay, fair. Enough. <laughs> <laughs> now we know yeah he's awesome i don't want to be gay i'm 42 years old i'm, I'm too old to to, to have that confusion all right oh, so perfect. rufus shinra is testing you i get yeah, it yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's rufus I so i gotta say that and we have oh the elevator boss fight i do like this spin on that because that's a cool boss fight in the original one that's a really memorable oh yeah, boss fight, yeah and yeah, they yeah. kind of like spin that into its own thing here mm-hmm. yeah it's awesome like fighting right downstairs and stuff that's great yeah loved it loved it it was fine and the motorcycle cut scene oh right my after God. that where it, where it hits the dudes in the face that's so fun dude but it play, dude the music hits hard i remember when cloud like lands on the motorcycle it's so good it plays the theme mm-hmm. and when they're leaving there's like that one soldier against the wall or something like that trying to stop them mm. Cloud like throws his sword right at mm-hmm. him like it's so good, man. I love it's that so, shit. It's so dramatic and fucking yeah. awesome, man. Yeah, it's so <laughs> good. Cloud does some poses. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He does. He knows he he knows he looks cool. It, it, it happens immediately in the bombing run when when he's about to fall and he does a flip and then Jesse yep. says, hey, that was pretty cool. And he, he just fucking smiles to himself. Yeah. He's like, yeah, I know, yeah. man. That felt good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Cloud feels himself, man. He loves himself. Yeah, he definitely. He does. You know? <laughs> um, all right, Brett, let's go around and talk about what we think about the kind of the way the game ends. Not uh-huh. the, the original ending, not the Yuffie. We'll talk about the Yuffie stuff after this. Well, Brad, let's start with you. So we have the, the motorcycle highway scene. It's cool. They expand uh-huh. that yeah. out and buff that out, which is pretty Gotta fun. I like yep. fighting the thing with the, the six wheels. You kind of have to fuck up and yeah, get it down. Yeah, turn that into that boss fight just like that, which I think is fine. Yeah, and I, li- well, 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 I like that it end. seems so impossible, actually, at first, or not even impossible, but it's like you're not doing any damage to it, and then you realize you, you, you the stagger gauge is just getting insanely high uh, yeah. the more you do it, and then you're just doing an insane amount of damage to it, so that was kind of cool. And it ends with these um, these fights with, uh, I don't know, what is it, like a whisper? A, it's like the giant whisper? The I don't know. Murder of fate or something? I forgot yeah, exactly the name. Yeah, if you look at the assess, it's an arbiter. And it's Mm -hmm. like uh, the three, the three things you fight that are like the Avon children guys Mm -hmm. that we all pretty much think they are because they have the same weapons and everything. Mm -hmm. So I forgot their, their names are like Yuzu and Kadaj or something like that. Yeah. 
I forgot all their names, but yeah, them getting tied into there is really sick. Then you fight like the Bahamut one. That's really awesome. And everyone just teams up and shit. It's great. And of course, Sephiroth, but we could probably get to that after. What do you think uh, of the way that, you know, yeah, we'll talk about the ending itself, so we'll leave that. But what do you think about the way the game culminates, Hogue? Uh, the, the last the last fights and the way things My feelings are complicated, yeah. right? So I love this game. I'm enjoying it. I've been watching these whispers do weird things. I, I really remember it being the most dramatic in terms of what they were doing when you're meeting with Aerith in her in, in the church and they're moving you around rooms and saving you from falling down multiple flights and things like that. Um, and this is really where the game announces that this isn't a remake, that this is going to be something different. Uh, and so I remember feeling like this was not my Final Fantasy at the time. Like you walk through that portal, which I think is a really cool effect, and you're going to have these fights. Um, but I don't, I don't hate it as much now as I used to. It's just a kind of acceptance that this isn't the project I thought I was getting. Uh, and I didn't love either the fights themselves or having to fight these giant tornado fate monsters, right? Like that's not Final Fantasy VII to me. That's not that's not what you're fighting. You're not fighting these kind of giant building size ghost things. Uh, and that's just a different type of enemy than I wanted to fight. It reminds me more of modern Square Enix, more of a Kingdom Hearts, more of that kind of thing. Uh, and so I wasn't really happy with it. I do like some of the skill set it takes. I like some of the skills that it takes to have that fight. Uh, and using all of the materia and all of the action that you have built across the game, uh, as well as in the fight with Sephiroth. But I didn't love it at the time. Uh, and while I, I kind of philosophically like the notion of, okay, if we break out of our shell, we can go anywhere we want. I also thought even in the moment that that promise was probably a little bit hollow because nobody actually wants to play Final Fantasy VII and not play Final Fantasy VII at the same time. So I didn't really think things were going to get too far afield from there. I thought it was a kind of weird half position to take at the end of the game. So unfortunately in narrative, I don't tend to love mystery for the sake of mystery. So some of the stuff they do with like the final cutscene and, and Zach uh, and, and the ghosts walking past each other and that kind of thing, I didn't love, but I did like that there could be something new and different in the future. So it's, it's a complicated set of emotions for me at the end of the game. What? That's interesting. I love like all of that. I'm on the exact opposite mm. end. That's and okay. the whisper thing, I guess it doesn't bother me because you fight like giant ass goofy things in the original game. Like all the weapons are like humongous Godzilla monsters. So I love the weapons. I was like, oh yeah, we're like, I'm totally cool with all that good goofy shit, like flying, jumping around and stuff. But yeah, that's just me, I guess. Where are you on this, uh, Gene? Uh, uh, when I first beat it in 2020 um, and I got to the end, the end of the freeway, I just pointed at my screen. I said, rebuild. They're doing it. This is Evangelion rebuild. I had, I, I had no idea that, that that's what they were going to do. So for, uh, should I talk about how Evangelion rebuild works? You guys want to know? Um, no. It, if it's, it'll be yeah, a spoiler, we'll just, yeah, we shouldn't risk okay, it. Never mind. Yeah, I'm sorry. Anyways, yeah. So I, I pointed out, I said rebuild. Um, and I felt very confused, just like Hogue. Mm -hmm. um, could, because originally... I really just wanted a straightforward remake of Final Fantasy VII Remake. I, I would just would have liked to have just a, a straightforward retelling. And so when I got to that part, it was a little, it felt, a, it, it didn't land quite as hard for me, even though I did, I was interested and curious. And then I thought about it a little bit more like a week later and I was like, okay, I'm into it because I, I do, I started to think about the meta aspect of everything that we talked about at the very, very beginning of the episode. And I started to appreciate that meta aspect of, of, of mm. the challenge of having to, the, 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 the philosophical challenge of having to remake a game as monumental to Square Enix as Final yeah. Fantasy VII. You know, this is, this is a game that built the company that it is today, you know? So, you know, Hogue is always bringing about modern Final Fantasy, right? Modern Final Fantasy started here in Final Fantasy VII, you know? And that's why I used to complain all the time. I used to be such a hipster about Final Fantasy. I was like, this is too anime. Look at Cloud's hair. That's too anime. <laughs> I hate this. Tetsuya Nomura is ruining Final Fantasy by making it too anime. There's too many science fiction elements. It's too cyberpunk. Why, why are we riding a motorcycle in Final Fantasy, right? Um, but I started to really, really uh, get used to it. And then, so I, I don't know what I'm talking about. But yeah, by the end of Remake, I started to, to, to really enjoy it and kind of enjoy that, that meta aspect of, of kind of having to 
feeling like they they they, they do need to revisit these memories, you know. Mm-hmm. And it feels like they're they are treating Final Fantasy VII as a memory of Final Fantasy VII, you know. Right. And I I, I feel like that that really ties into what the themes are, you know, because Aerith remembers things that she should remember, you know. Right. Um, and it, it it kind of echoes the it mirrors it's a mirror of the player experience, especially if you played the OG, you know. Yeah. Um, especially since if you played it 20 years ago and you might not remember. So you might have vague memories of what's going on, you know. But it feels so familiar and kind of right until yeah. it feels wrong. It's you know? nostalgic. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think, Colin? How do you feel about all of it? Yeah. Um, I love the... I, I, first of all, I think, I think it's awesome. Like they, they... The game is about, for me, is about the tension of free will and fate and how they keep getting wrapped back in and then finally break like out of the bounds once and for all. And Sephiroth de- de- delivers the line, which is awesome. He says, he says, careful now that which lies ahead does not yet exist. Mm. And mm. I'm like, wow, this is a deeply, it is deeply sci-fi. Like mm-hmm. what they're doing. It's strange, but it's subtle. It's subtle. Like inception is subtle sci-fi mm-hmm. where mm-hmm. It's not interstellar in space and like you're fucking time traveling or whatever the hell it's going on. It's just like there's a subtle like uh, like mysticism to the way things are working Mm -hmm. and it becomes more obvious and overt when they're able to break things and realize, you know, as the player that now moving forward, my assumption, I haven't played the game yet. I will beginning tonight from what we're recording, but is things things start to break into a more triangular shape where things broaden out and your vision broadens out of what happens next i would assume that's so interesting that you said triangular shape in particular yeah. that's fascinating oh interesting i'll keep yeah, that in mind yeah 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 so yeah. so <laughs> i i dig it because and again it's what i'm saying about how i hope square enix doesn't glean the wrong information from this like it's been, it's a very successful move in my opinion to take a game like final fantasy 7 that's so storied and say like again what we were talking about early in the episode about this meta story about the tension around changing anything and the sanctity of what's already happened and realizing that it's hopefully like this product that deserved that and that it's got to be a very not only a very special thing but a reason like there was what we didn't realize about final fantasy 7 remake was there was a reason to make it it wasn't Mm -hmm. just Mm -hmm. we want to remake final fantasy 7 and for modern consoles which is its own reason but that's kind of a commercial reason there could be a creative Mm -hmm. reason behind it too we want to show you what we always imagine okay blah 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 but there is really an, an an initiative behind this to say it doesn't remove Final Fantasy VII as a product. It doesn't try to replicate it at all. It doesn't. It's not a copy of it, and it sits next to it in a different. Like I said, it's like string theory timeline shit. And that's what I don't realize. There's something I actually don't understand at the end. Mm. So Zach dies in Crisis Core. Yes. Mm-hmm. And an OG. Right, and, and, and right, right. Yes. In the, right, in history. And cri- well, so I should in say history. that Final Fantasy VII and Crisis Core do take place in the same timeline in my mind. Like they are yeah, yes. the linear continuation of each other, right? Yes, that's so correct. We see, so Z- Z- Cloud gets the Buster Sword from Zack, who got it from... Angeal. Right, Angeal. But then we, am I crazy in thinking Zack is now dragging cloud like or, or like there was that's what i said what are you talking about there's a scene so at the end where the, zach is like stumbling forward with what i thought was it's cloud right that's cloud is carrying yeah so there's two clouds maybe yeah you don't get know. you don't get an answer to this now yeah sorry who knows, Colin. Colin? yeah who knows because yeah. i don't think i got that the first time no, the, the, you're not supposed to know the answer to this. Yeah, you're so. not supposed to know. Right, because it's yeah, like, okay, so like the shoe is on the other foot, I guess, in this yeah, universe. That's part, that's part of the mystery box that Hogue doesn't like, I think, right? That's exactly uh, yeah. what you were talking about, Hogue, right? I'm sorry. It is. This is yeah. yeah, no, it's it's the kind of mystery for mystery's sake, right? They don't yeah. give you the answers. They yeah. give you a lot of interesting possibilities yeah. that you can think through and you can theorize on your favorite forum, Yeah. Um, which a lot of these kind of artistic endeavors like, right? Because that's engagement and that's conversation. This is absolutely that's intentional. Theater. That's exactly what they said, yeah. Uh, um, yeah, of course it is. There's but I don't, three parts. Yeah. I don't like <sighs> that type of storytelling. Uh, and I... I no spoilers for Rebirth and content, but I will tell you they launch right back into that from the top of Rebirth. 
So, I mean, like that's one of the things they're doing with this project is what's happening. What, what, what what's going on? Can you keep yeah. track of any of this? And it's like, you, you just have to trust that they're not going to JJ Abrams you. And then it's not going to be the last season of lost and something's going to make sense at the end. Right. So we're trusting that for the project. I don't love that feeling because I have a lot of distrust for creatives, but <laughs> The, the remake project so far has earned my trust, and so I'm hopeful for the end of Rebirth, which I haven't gotten to yet, and of course, whatever the third game is. Yeah, it's so interesting you say that, because I get, especially with the Lost analogy, because I can totally relate to mm-hmm. falling off of that show so badly towards the end where I'm like, it's clear that you guys have no fucking idea what's going on here. And <laughs> I was so resentful of that. Really, in, in a lot of different ways. Too. Yeah, where I was just like, it was so, especially the first two seasons were like so mm-hmm. cool and good and the numbers Perfect. and the smoke monster and the fucking this and that. And it's like, oh my God, this is polar so bear. great. Yeah, the yeah. polar bear and the Dharma initiative. And and then it's the just hatch, like, it's towards the end, the it's hatch, like, damn, man. dude, what the fuck? I really trust, it is, there is a trust there. It's like, I got people into this show, for Christ's sake, you know, and <laughs> yeah, you don't want you don't want to get too burned there, but I feel like, but I don't know if I'm I don't know if I'm interpreting. I was so pissed. Yeah. Oh my god, yeah, totally. I was like, I had like a fake, you know, like a holiday dinner, you know, years ago. I was like, I'm sorry to everyone about that. You know, like I'm the one who like came home from college and was like, you gotta watch this fucking show. And it was during the DVD era, right, where everyone was sharing the seasons of DVDs and stuff. So yeah, it was very yeah, shareable yeah. and easy to watch. But I. I just don't know if I'm interpreting the ending right. I guess I guess you guys will have obviously much more knowledge of yeah. it, but it's stop it, asking about it. Yeah, it's it's fair because <laughs> for me, I'm like, did he? Is it like, did he? But yeah, I mean, I can put this, myself the, in the, the shoes realities or something. I, I don't know. I don't know. I'm sorry. What were yeah, you saying? I mean, about? I can. I was saying I can put myself in the shoes before rebirth and say those are exactly the questions I had. Right? You got this. You've got this other scene that doesn't end the way you remember it ending and you've got a different picture of the the mascot dog on the potato chip bag that flies Mm -hmm. by and you're looking at these various things and going what's happening uh and the game ends with you know the unknown journey and it's just the entire ending of final fantasy 7 remake is uh, is the creator saying you should be asking what's happening come check out our next product to find out more it's like okay uh, but uh, I don't think you can actually get to better answers than that with what they give you in remake. Deeply sci-fi, yeah. I which yeah. I yeah I love I, I I didn't expect that from because fi- mm-hmm. you could say Final Fantasy has been sci-fi before. I don't really know if that's if I would ever describe anything Final Fantasy has done as truly sci-fi. Like maybe thirteen would be the closest thing in some sense to maybe thirteen. Yeah. You know because you know six is steampunk and. Maybe ten a little. Ten is just kind of modern. So well, thirteen has a giant artificial moon. So yeah, that's yeah. true. So, but it's for me. I just look at it and I think, okay, this is so strange. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> like <laughs> wow. Okay, I, I'm down with it. I, it's it's surprising how much I like it. I'm I'm somewhat of a purist, but I like mm-hmm. that they're breaking free now of the original and have led us. I, it's 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 being led along. But in a good way, because the I, I think at least the way the game ends, I'm quite satisfied with the mystery. You know, maybe I say that now as someone who I, who I know I'll now be able to crack it. It's not me in 2020 when I first played it with years of distance between mm. me and the answer. No, there, there's there are answers coming of some kind. Um, the only other thing I wanted to add to this conversation in terms of criticism was. I also like the themes of what is faded and whether you can break it or not, but Final Fantasy as a series explored that particular theme very in depth in 13 and 15 and then remake. Hmm. Like this is their theme for the last couple of games. Uh, 13 is all about what is fate and whether or not you're bound to your your destiny and the characters deciding to break free. 15 is a little bit of that, a little less so, but still overall, still in the 13 Malou, it was versus 13. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then remake kind of having that not be the theme because that's not the theme of seven. And then making it the theme did feel like modern Square Enix superimposing what it wants to do on the game. So I don't hate it as much as I did when I first played it. I really said at that time that I liked 95% of the game and hated the last 5%, but it's still not my favorite thing that they've ever done. Mm. 
Interesting. I I like the ending because it made me as a longtime fan have questions and things to look forward to. I love not getting all the answers right away. I think it's important to have a narrative to lead you along and things to look forward to. I would be disappointed, I guess, if they answered all those questions right away. Yeah. I think you need to have some mystery. It just depends if it pays off in the end. I was initially with Hogue and I've landed on Brad basically over the years where it's like, yeah, no, I, the, 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 all the answers aren't supposed to be here. So maybe I can just chill, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. Let me, let me just chill and have fun with the game. Yeah, it's seasonal, you know? you know? Yeah. Yeah. I guess to me at the time, and again, I don't really feel that now. At the time, I felt like they didn't feel like the mysteries that are inherent in the narrative of Final Fantasy VII could stand on their own and and be sufficient for players, right? The mm-hmm. mysteries in Final Fantasy VII are huge as it is. Who the hell is yeah, Cloud? That's true. That's true. Right? That's Who really is true. Cloud? That's and they've got all those mystery scenes in remake. They've got the static breaks uh-huh. and the and the mm-hmm. collapses and the various things happening. And then they add on Ghosts of Fate. Yes. So yes. I just didn't love it. Yeah. That's yeah. Very true. Well, they got Absolutely. three games to tell all that. So yeah. they got a lot. To, they got a lot to say still. Yeah. But to, to Hoke's point, there is already a lot of mystery in FF7. I'd be so yep. fascinated to hear what Hoke thinks of the, of the end of, of once he finishes Rebirth. So I have certain notions of what that might be, but I have not mm. finished it because yeah. I have gotten enough of what we'll call the mystery plot line to mm. have some theories. Mm. Okay. As far as the Yuffie expansion is concerned, first love of all, it to death. Yeah, this is good. Love the Moogle hat. Mm-hmm. Now, I have, a, I have a fundamental question about this too, and you guys will know more about it than me probably. Sure. Is this like is there a, is Yuffie's experience different in the two games too? And are, are we to assume? Hmm. In other words, we find her in a totally different place in the original Final Fantasy yes. VII, so we assume that her reality is different here as well, although she wouldn't be aware of it, right? Although she, I guess, has... Well, anyway, I don't know. Am I... Well, I think it's important to separate like the, the choices made in making a remade version of Final Fantasy VII and whatever might be breaking fate from the plot line of Final Fantasy VII. Mm-hmm. So like Yuffie appearing in a different place or in a different location, I think can just be a creative choice. Kate Sith seeing the plate mm-hmm. fall mm-hmm. is not a function of the whispers of fate. It's just what they thought was appropriate. Yeah, exactly. Right. 2020. So, so mm-hmm. th- okay. So that's, that's good to know. So mm-hmm. we can assume that we just didn't have this context of her. Yeah. Yes. That yeah. that yes. context that's is that's now the it. truth. Right. Yes. yes. Right. Interesting. That's how I take it. We're just seeing we're just seeing a, a, an untold story of Yuffie. Got basically. it. Exactly. Got it. Yeah. Because yeah. you would feel like that would have come up. Yeah. Yeah. Because well, I don't want to spoil it for myself, but it seems like you meet Vincent in a different way. In this, in some, in in Rebirth, from what I could tell, but I don't even want. Don't even. Don't even. Give Stop me a, asking questions. Yeah. Colin. <laughs> okay. We'll not talk about Yuffie or Vincent. Yeah. Fair. Let's talk about. We'll talk about Yuffie. <laughs> So uh, yeah, we'll talk about it in intermission. Intermission, we'll talk about. I love it. intermission. Yeah. So this DLC, and I'm sorry to jump on you, Colin. No, please you go can on. just tell me to shut up. Um, this DLC was one of the ones that I have enjoyed the most out of any DLCs I've ever purchased. Like I somehow squeezed 12 hours of content out of this thing because I was enjoying myself so much. Because this is my favorite battle system, as we talked about. Yuffie has some really interesting things to do. One of the reasons I love this battle system is because each character feels like its own game. Like Barrett feels entirely different from Cloud and Aerith feels different than both of them. Tifa feels different. Now Yuffie feels different. And I apologize. I cannot remember the name of her partner. What's Sonon. Partner? Sonon, yeah. Sonon. Yeah. And them working together works so much better even than the party working in the main game that I really felt like this was them trying to figure out how to evolve their product Mm -hmm. into what would eventually become known as Rebirth. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I just love this. And you add Mm -hmm. on Fort Condor, I'm a sucker for a uh, improving mini game across multiple fights. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so Fort Condor plus hard mode plus Yuffie's plot line made me so, so happy. I really love this DLC. And that comes from someone who doesn't actually love some of the end state of the plot of the DLC, right? I don't love the compilation stuff. We've already talked about that. I'm not a huge fan of the Genesis stuff. So that coming out at the end did give me at least one moment of pause to say, okay, if they're remaking Final Fantasy VII, do they mean to remake all the stuff that went around Final Fantasy VII Mm -hmm. into the the main product? Because that Mm -hmm. might be a concern because I don't love that flavor as much. Mm -hmm. But I think Intermission overall is a tremendous success. What do you think, Gene? 
Uh, I agree. I, I think it's a tremendous success. I think, uh, gosh, what else? Uh, for Condor. Uh, I, I wish I had more to say <laughs> about Intermission because I did play Remake last month, but I didn't finish Intermission. All I did was play Fort Condor because <laughs> I really, really want to Understandable. Play. Really yeah, was, I really, really want to play Fort Condor. It's fun. So, I feel like yeah, you could I jumped kind into of... that and I, I did all different levels for Condor and I just kind of stopped uh, the intermission. I got so the fourth level and then I stopped because I felt like I needed to get through the game where I was going to be late. You know, so I was like, I, mm. but I, yeah, exactly. And, and, and I just ended up spending four hours just doing for Condor the whole time and just not progressing the story at all. I do remember Sonon. Sonon was cool. I do remember the combat system. You're absolutely right, Hogue. It really, really feels like that they took this opportunity to kind of have a cheap version, a cheap way to, or maybe a cheap, but also uh a way they can sell but also experiment uh how to evolve the combat system to have more synergy literally uh between yes. the two characters and it was it was really really fun and amazing to to be, basically be able to control sonon on, on your own as yuffie you know it's it's kind of like astral chain uh, the very uh, little known really? platinum game on, on on the nintendo switch where you have your police officer and then you have a monster and then you're both controlling th- them at the same time and so this felt like their own take of that kind of combat system system um mm-hmm. yuffie's so fun she's, she's she's she has long distance she has magic she's just kind of all over she's a complete firecracker of a combat system you know uh she's probably the so most strong she's extremely extremely strong uh even in rebirth there's a really really funny game spot video of, of like an explosion like behind yuffie and she's like this but then you can you can there's a build of yuffie that, that just completely breaks the game and you can, I, I feel like you can almost make that here in intermission too where it's, it's, she's just completely completely powerful uh, mm-hmm. So much fun to play. She, I think between all the characters, is like Tifa and Yuffie are my favorite characters to play. You know, it's Tifa is so fun. Yeah, yeah and Yuffie is, fun. is just fantastic. Yeah. You, yeah. You, it was funny when they were explaining the Yuffie stuff in the beginning. They had the tutorials or whatever. Part of me was like, oh come on, man! Like I just I don't want to like learn yeah. a new combat system for a two hour thing or whatever. It ended up being five hours, mm-hmm. but and but I quickly realize she's incredibly overpowered like it, it makes it makes <laughs> a lot of the fights really trivial if you use that l2 attack to bind them together or that l2 option to bind mm-hmm. their attacks together and then do like the super mm-hmm. version of it it's there's really no penalty to doing that you just have to build up your your enter your level mm-hmm. ap or whatever it is your action points but yeah i really dug that too brad i need you though to you can tell me what you think here of course but i also need you to kind of rope me into the lore here because dirge of cerberus I did play, but it was <laughs> right. a long time ago. The only thing I remember about it is that at IGN, we had a wall of games that we hated that we would, that our friend Mark Ryan, the guides editor would put up and it said something like the wall of shame or whatever. And mm-hmm. it was just boxes of the games attached with like uh, tape or whatever. And we would shoot arrows at them and Dirge of Cerberus was on that wall. Mm-hmm. And that's really my most, my biggest memory of it. So the reality is, I don't know if it was as bad as we remember it being or Mm. part of me feels like it probably was because I feel like they would have found a way to re-release it, especially within the context of now it being kind of relevant and they haven't done that. But I I, I, I guess what I'm saying is I just I don't remember anything about this and I know that the connection is here because I I recognize I think it was Deep Ground specifically. That's ground, baby. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, So so tell me your thoughts, but also explain what the hell is going on here. I'll sit back and listen. Uh, well, it was interesting when I saw Deep Ground was mentioned because I was like, oh, shit, here we go. Because I don't really like Dirge of Cerberus. I'm not a huge fan of that game. So right away, I was like, oh, boy, because I knew what was coming with all that stuff. And eventually we did get Nero. But it makes sense that that's where Deep Ground <laughs> is. They are in the Shinra down there. They are a unit technically in the lore of it. So it makes sense to me if they introduce them because that's where they go. So I'm like, okay, well, they're going to be a part of this now. Um, but yeah, I like, I don't really know what else to say. It's just like, I was, I'm not surprised, but I was like, ah, oh, shit at the same time. Cause I knew what deep ground meant and Georgia Cerberus. Eventually you guys were talking about the re-release of that game. Potentially. I, my theory is that they're going to tie more of that stuff into the later games. And I'm assuming I'm going to guess that rebirth, if rebirth has a DLC, it's going to be Vincent stuff. I'm going to guess. And maybe some of that will tie into there. Cause Vincent is of course linked to all that, but it was cool to see like Scarlet involved in all that kind of stuff with deep ground. Cause it, I mean, someone's got to know about all that stuff. So I'm like, okay with it, but I'm not like 
thrilled. I'm not like, hell yeah. I'm just like, all right, see where this goes, I guess. Scarlet. The Scarlet killed Dine and then. Yeah. Or no, well. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Okay. Scar is the one that chops Barrett's arm off. Right, basically. right. And then yeah. I don't know these things. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. Um, okay. Oh, sorry. I thought it was cool to um I guess to include Sonon with there. You know, Sonon dies technically or gets taken by Nero. So that'll tie into something more with Yuffie down the line. So we'll get a little more besides her whole Wu Tai story, which I think it's cool. I, th- I thought it was cool to have like someone from Wu Tai with her throughout the whole that journey cool. and all that stuff. And like again, deference to her too, which is cool. Yeah. Mm-hmm. At, yeah. Called her boss right. or master boss, right? Boss. Yeah. Yeah. Boss. Yeah. I love that. And I dig the, um, I don't know. I, the, there was a, there was a level of violence to Sonon's death that I didn't yeah. expect yeah, in, a yeah. final, in a core final fantasy game and was really heart wrenching and sad from, Yuffie's perspective and the way yeah. she runs out and is just crying runs really no regard for herself at all running away from right. from the Shinra like just way, running away from the buildings so no one's even paying attention to her because of because the explosion mm-hmm. had just happened it's happening mm-hmm. yeah. right and mm-hmm. so that was uh deep and sad oh and, yeah yeah I liked I tying it back to sector seven was amazing too yeah yeah so oh yeah you see vice in that don't you too or they yeah like you do talk you about do you vice? fight yeah. you can fight him i think <laughs> you, fight him. Yeah, you can you can in the data thing yeah because there's a Hard fight. there's a trophy for that but i didn't i didn't explore that so my plan for for these games in the future is like maybe when the third one comes out i'll go back and play hard mode final fantasy 7 remake hard mode final fantasy 7 rebirth into the new final fantasy 7 okay. have, have that all set up as a stepping stone so at that point, I really like the hard modes of these because they're a little bit more like puzzle solving. They're a little bit more figuring mm. out strategically how to make your way through these things because they limit your ability to heal mm-hmm. with items. That's, that's part of the you hard can, mode. You can still heal like with magic and stuff, mm-hmm. but you can't use like items that's and all that. That would. Yeah, that would mega potions come in pretty useful later. I don't use too many items, maybe an ether here and there. Well, mm-hmm. you can't use items, and I don't think benches heal you anymore. Yeah, that right? I think that's. that's right. I think that's. Oh wow, correct. that's pretty hardcore. Yeah, yeah. yeah so it's, it's a like lot more a... strategic, but it's not. They don't raise the enemies up so high that you have to be perfect on the thing. So it's really more about managing the overall advancement through a chapter. Interesting. It's uh, like, and I think it's a really it's, cool approach. It's new game plus, essentially, Colin. You keep all your levels and materia and all that stuff. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. So that should be relatively manageable if and when the time comes. But yeah. It's manageable. Um, I do like the bean. What, what's with the, the beans that they're sharing and like breaking people's teeth? Oh, uh, like to chow bean yeah, or so something. It's, it's just cute. It's just funny. Called. Also, the yeah, the happy turtle stuff with the poster. Oh, my God. And the great songs. nod. Yeah, it's oh, great yeah. nod. Yeah. Can't wait to see that. The I like the different songs. There's like a metal song that someone's singing about. Yeah. About the happy turtle, which is pretty cool. So, yeah, I really enjoyed the the DLC it, it took me about 5 hours to get through but i must admit mm-hmm. that i spent at least an hour and a half on four condor so i would say three and a half hours yeah. would be on everything else i didn't do yeah. i didn't get ramu you can get him by okay. fighting him at chadley's i tried to fight him once and i died but it was when i was alone i hadn't even had so yeah. in my party yet so mm-hmm. i never went back and tried to get that again so i didn't do that there is they do add stuff to the simulator after you beat it too Mm-hmm. so like fighting vice yeah, yeah. there's a few mm-hmm. right right so there's a few things i didn't do i i played it as organically as i would have though otherwise because in the regular game i tried to get the little trophies here and there that you can get but i'm just going to play all the side quests in a game so whatever's presented yeah. to me in a normal sort of fashion but once things get kind of crazy at a coliseum or with hunts or whatever the hell you're doing in a specific game, I kind of I I, I will back off at that point. So Vice sure. mentioning Vice just reminded me that the before the remake, the the last the very very last story scene in the original story of Final Fantasy VII is Vice discovering the body of Genesis. And, and, <laughs> yeah, and dude. <laughs> and, and 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 that's the cliffhanger that yeah, Final that's Fantasy VII f- ends. Yeah, that's the and furthest just, that we have in the timeline. That's line. the furthest. That's the latest event in the original Final Fantasy VII. And then and then and then, and then, and then, and then it, they decided to tr- trash it all on remake. So Genesis yeah. looms. 
Final Fantasy VII Rejected. I'm not counting any of this stuff. Final Fantasy VII Rejected. Yeah. It's still yeah. a possibility. You know? That'd be interesting. You could still be Rejected. By the way, Yuffie, is, Yuffie knows Shinra's secret. I assume that will be relevant to... She overhears, like, and... and well, Sonan knows too, but he's dead. <laughs> So like as soon as I saw Sonan, I was like, he's too handsome. He's fucking dead. <laughs> yeah, I was say, I don't know what I was thinking. I liked I liked the foreshadowing though of the train where she mm-hmm. he's like on top of her in the train and Oh yeah, 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 mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. And then he dies like that with her. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um he's shielding her. He's he's not on top of her. I don't her. mean it in a bad way. I don't kind yeah. of train. Yeah, mm-hmm. I don't mean it in a in a sexually coercive way. <laughs> pervert, you, dude. You, you, you you're you're such a <laughs> All right. I really like Yuffie, and I was not a big Yuffie fan in the original. I didn't think she had a very strong character, uh, and I think that they really, they really enhanced her character in Intermission and moving forward. Yeah, she was always I, cool from an aesthetic point of view because of the big ninja yeah. star, and she's like, a, we know she's a materia hunter, and Wu Tai's got a cool vibe, the gold arm thing. Yeah, that, like it's like right. an arm, like leather arm. I don't know what is that shield? Shield. Yeah, it's it's pretty cool. Yeah. So it's pretty cool. But they do. So she had that aesthetic going, but yeah, not a really a great. She was annoying, actually. Remember in the original, she would you would encounter her ran, in random encounters and have to like goad her to your side or whatever. Mm-hmm. So she was uh, she was optional, right? You didn't have to get mm-hmm. her at all. Completely, she, completely optional. Yeah, and same with yeah, Vincent. Her, her, so it's her, cool. Her and Vincent too. Right. Vincent so it's too. cool that they like folded them in in a more mandatory way to the story for those that missed her the first time. Like, I wonder I how many biggest... people played the games casually. It's easier to miss Yuffie than Vincent, I think, actually, because you definitely will encounter Vincent. It's just a matter of if you can wake him up or not. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So, and I still have my, I don't know where it is, but I have my Vincent. Remember when they released in the late nineties, those action figures, you would buy them on like EB. I have the Vincent mm-hmm. one, yeah. but I don't yeah, know. That's those are, it's here somewhere. Those are, good. those are really, really good figures too. They are. And yeah. the Metal Gear Solid figures that. from that era were also really good. I don't know if McFarland yeah. did them or who did them, but Todd McFarland, yeah. Todd McFarland, yeah. Well, well, they're good designs. The Final Fantasy VII characters. One of the reasons I think this whole project works is that the characters are so good in design. They're they're well voice acted. They have a lot of cool beats. They have a lot of good mysteries. They have a lot of good connections with each other. That makes an RPG, mm-hmm. but they're cool to look at almost all the time. Mm-hmm. I'm excited to, because I'm not going to be ready in time for the the summon sign for the game at least that that's done at first but kind of just play it more casually maybe not take so many notes and just kind of yeah enjoy just, yeah 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 if you have 3900 words on remake i don't even know what your notes total would be for yeah. rebirth yeah just i gotta be more persnickety probably with my notes play it for yourself yeah just play it for yourself man yeah, i think There's i will no more pressure i think i will yeah. well is there anything else left I'm unsaid be- about this that you guys wanted to touch on and we've gone for three hours i don't want to keep you forever but is- no, yeah, I was just curious about your thoughts revisiting it. So it's really good to hear. It's a wonderful game. And it's truly, mm-hmm. it, it's far from flawless. I think that even games that I consider yeah, pretty close to being flawless, like The Last of Us have like Ellie running out in front of people and doing all sorts of weird shit. You kind of have to overlook something. And I think this game has a yeah. certain set of requirements for you to overlook something. But mm-hmm. I yeah. think overall, it's a really, really incredibly strong game, especially taken into context with the other Final Fantasy games, which, you know, I've always loved Crisis Core, especially, and to see that kind of mm-hmm. come to the fore, that was a very memorable PSP game for me. It's just, it was perfect for the PSP. Yeah. And having it come out a couple of years ago, again, was really like a nice shot in the arm about what it was even about and mm-hmm. and all the rest. So I like that they're tying them all together. It makes me eager to know what this new game is coming out, but also what their timeline is going to be and how they want to wrap it all up. And if it will fulfill like, like Hoke saying, the skepticism, or will it f- that promise, or will it fulfill the promise of delivery, like mm-hmm. uh, like Brad thinks. I have trust in them. I mean, I, the, it, when you play it, Colin, that the scope of Rebirth and what's in that game is incredible to my mind for what was four years, right? I actually remember them giving interviews before the project was known to the public that said we're we're trying to sp- split it up so we can make these games on a more rapid basis and then when rebirth took so long i was thinking well that was a lie that's just typical square enix uh but with what rebirth actually puts on the table and what should be required to make the third part of the final fantasy 7 story i think we're actually going to get this thing finished in a relatively short amount of time i hope so so 
I have confidence in them on this project. And I wouldn't have said that as early as a year before Final Fantasy VII Remake came out. Totally. So, yeah, it's, I'm, it, I'm I'm happy to have been very wrong. I, I'm wrong on things all the time. I speak into a microphone constantly, but this I was very happy to be wrong about was. Yep. Was it's game. the best kind of wrong. It, it, totally. And in, and in reflection over these four years or so, it, it still holds up. It's still really special. And yeah, I'm happy for Square Enix. I feel like they're, especially on the back of Final Fantasy 16, a bunch of the other smaller games that they've released, some of the the games that they've revisited as well, like Act Razor, Tactics Ogre, these games, uh, mm. Star Ocean more recently, which I know people yep. really liked. And really, I'm so intrigued by what Dragon Quest 12 is going to be. And when they're going to show that off as well. So I feel like they're really going from strength to strength and I'm excited to see Rebirth. Well, and as a, you know, that's it. As a Final Fantasy fan, I remake 16 Rebirth might be as strong as 789 back in the 90s. Yeah, totally. I mean, it's just a tremendous I mean, series yeah, yeah. of Final Fantasies. I agree. Yeah, that's, yeah. Well, that's very well said. And I do wonder, it's interesting. Like, so we have the Pixel Remasters, all the Hullabaloo around seven, nine's going to get it. Remastered 10 has been re-released a bunch of times in HD remasters. I do wonder like what's going to go on if, if eight is a target for anything. Cause that game uh, is so kind of a, an update a little bit when they put it on PS4, right? Like they it's a PC the port or whatever. And we have those of, no, like, they made new models for a lot oh, did of the they really? and stuff. They did, they did. Oh, yeah, okay. Cause yeah. I bought and downloaded that and I didn't notice that at all. So that's, I wonder if that will be the most that they, that's interesting. I wonder if that would be now. the most work that they do. No, yeah, them. but but for it now, looks maybe. good though. It looks good. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's, it's a it's a good version of the game to play. Yeah, I, I got I distracted when I played it. Though. I don't know. I wasn't crazy. I'm not crazy about that game for a very fundamental reason. Like the the, the I don't like the junction system. It's just too so. easy to manipulate the game. <laughs> yeah, it, like as it's weird. As I recall, the game is easiest if you don't fight. Right, like you. you yeah. The idea is to avoid fighting, yeah. as I recall. And yeah, that yeah. kind of is because, like lame. I want to when I fight, I want to level up and become stronger and not have scaling and all the random shit that they do to ruin the game. So, yeah, yeah. The, 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 the way you level up is how you use the junction system. And if you didn't engage with that, then, yeah, you, this is this. It was definitely not a Dragon Quest game for sure. Yeah. Sadly. Well, yeah, eight is weird. But I, as as someone that remembers now playing the Final Fantasy seven games, how much I enjoyed Final Fantasy's kind of bent for romance and soap mm-hmm. opera, mm-hmm. which comes about in Everyone Wants Cloud, uh, then I I really do like Final Fantasy eight for being the unabashedly most romantic Final Fantasy. Yeah. Uh, and so there's a lot to like there in the story, but the systems are wonky. Yeah. All right. Let's go around the horn and say goodbye. We'll leave it here for now. It's good to have this group. I thought this was a really fun conversation. Brad, thank you for joining us today. Hope you had a hope it was fruitful for you and you enjoyed yourself. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Goodbye to you. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. Goodbye, everybody. Oh, you're very welcome. We'll talk again soon. Mr. Hogue, thank you for taking the time to talk to us today. We'll have you back soon as well. Absolutely. I love talking about Final Fantasy. Thanks for having me. Yeah, you're welcome. I, I, did I realize? Did I say it at the top of the show? I don't even realize. I don't even remember. I invited Hulk like very last minute to this because I have him lined up for another podcast we're doing that I want to do. Um, that Mike is going to email you about, and I was like, "Oh no, they're not the same show." So about forty five minutes before we started recording, I just asked him impromptu, "Do you want to join us?" Because I thought you were already were. Mm-hmm. Mm. Not too sharp. Right, which is not Colin's normal way. I, I this is the first time I've gotten a message from him that says we're starting in forty five minutes. Yeah. Right. Uh do you want to be on that show? And I said, I haven't beaten Rebirth yet. He said, No, it's remake. I said, mm. Okay, yes, I can talk about remake. Let's go. Yeah, no, I I am glad you could make the time. I'm sorry. No, it is very <laughs> unlike me. But Dagan blame Dagan, he fucked everything up. All right. Gene, <laughs> goodbye to you, my friend. Good to see you. I'll see you again soon, I'm sure. It's it's fun to talk Final Fantasy with you, especially Colin, because I have a n- nostalgia for Crisis Core, the, the one that just came out two years ago, mm. because the spoiler cast that you and I did together for for Crisis Core was actually the first official Gene Park and LSM collaboration. Awesome. Oh, when when nice. I became an official Hogue like contributor to to the thing, sick. But also, Crisis Core oh, came you've, out. You far surpassed Hogue level contributions. <laughs> I, well, I have not at this point. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, but but also, Crisis Core came out right after I got better. You know. Oh, nice. So Crisis Core was kind of, was literally the first video game I played when I realized I can envision a tomorrow. So sick. I have a lot of fondness for just talking about Final Fantasy with you. Like it, like it felt great to talk about Crisis Core. 
thinking about Crisis Core is great. So this was really fun. Cool, man. I'm glad you had that. Well, I'm sorry. Yeah. What did you say there, Hulk? I just said games are the best. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I, I was going to yeah, say, yeah. I have so many good memories about being able to play games slowly during my recovery. Yeah, uh, and I'll, I'll feel warm thoughts about games like Dredge forever. And it's like, it's not that Dredge is a warm game, mm-hmm. but it's one of the first games I could play with my thumb because you're mostly just piloting a boat around. There you go, man. And it's like, yeah, it's fantastic. Hell yeah, dude. Like, hell yeah, dude. Mm-hmm. Love it. That's an awesome story. Well, my yeah. boys, I appreciate you coming on, being with me today. We'll have you all back soon in your different capacities. And uh, thank you all out there for your love, kindness, and support. More than three hours on Final Fantasy VII Remake, four years after it came out. We'll, of course, have much more to say about <laughs> Final Fantasy VII, um, Rebirth, and whatever the fuck they call the third one at some point. I don't, do we, we don't know the name, right? They haven't even really. We can, we can, I like Revenge. Know. Revenge, yeah. <laughs> Revengeance. The reven- oh, yeah. Hell yeah. That would be sick. Yeah. We'll it's crazy with that, that they blew Reunion on Crisis Core. Um, it does seem like Reunion is the obvious answer for three, yeah. but it can't be, right? It can't be. No, yeah. It so. would be too, that would be too, it would be suitably confusing, but still too confusing. <laughs> You know, nonetheless, what if it's Final Fantasy VII returns? Just straight up Batman, Final Fantasy VII <laughs> oh, yeah. forever. You know, Final Fantasy VII, Final Fantasy VII forever. Revol- Final Fantasy, How about Final VII, Fantasy VII Revolution or something like that. You yeah, know, or, Revolution, yeah. Re- Re- Revelation, Revelation, Final Fantasy VII Revelation. There you go. That's it. That's probably it. I think it's got to be a singular noun if we're following along uh, remake and rebirth. But I do like return. Return. I feel like return might be it, or reprise maybe. Oh yeah, Re- yeah. reprise is sure. Square Enix weird. Yeah, yeah. reprise. Yeah, it's, it's Square Enix weird. You know, reprise, reprise by sleep or something. You know. <laughs> <laughs> all right, boys. Appreciate you. We'll see you next time. We'll see you all next time as well. Thank you. Goodbye. Sacred Symbols, a PlayStation podcast, is a product and trademark of Last Stand Media and Collins Last Stand LLC, and is proudly recorded in the USA. The show is conceived by, is written by, and is directed by me, Colin Moriarty. My co-hosts are Chris Raygun Maldonado and Dustin Furman. The show is produced by executive producer Dustin Furman. It's edited by associate producer Ben Smith. All of Last Stand's theme music is by my best friend, Ramon Narvaez. As you know, all of Last Stand's shows, including Sacred Symbols, are fan-funded on Patreon at patreon.com slash laststandmedia. The following names are at the producer level on Patreon, our highest tier, and we're grateful for your thoughtful and kind contributions to our independent endeavor. Thank you.